We are one We are We are one We And we are So much more than I could ever know Your love is deeper than this world will ever show And all of life's beauty shines around this moment now The sky and the cliffs, they seem to change my life somehow And I, I will never be, will never be the same Will never be the same Never be the same ever again Here I am waiting, Lord, my life is just for you Please unfold all the plans that you would have me do And if all the world's just a breath and nothing's here to stay Then all of the love we feel will save us anyway Never be, never be the same, never be the same. Oh, I, I will never be, never be the same, never be the same ever again.
Hello and welcome to another SDA Q&A. My special guest today is James Roy. How are you, James? Pretty well, Peter. You? I'm I'm terrific, and it's great to have you on the show. We're we're both uh, musos. I'm not an author, but uh, we are both former Seventh Day Adventists. That's correct. Yeah. And uh, we've shared a lot of similar uh, pathways in our journey, haven't we? Um, uh, your dad was uh, education director and went on to <clears throat> work up there at Avondale University. Mm -hmm. I think, and I think he's like 83 with his third PhD, just in the well, second, but yes. Second yeah. PhD. <laughs> <laughs> Who's counting? Who's counting? Hey, uh, everyone. Thank Mum you. is apparently. Yeah. Oh, yeah, she's counting. Good, good. <laughs> and uh, I know your brother and sister well also. Uh, a little bit embarrassing to say that I remember you from when you were in primary school days and early high school. When I think I was a special ed teacher in the high school, not, right. that, not that you were in my class, but uh, I observed all the students racing around. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'm just going to do something I don't normally do. I'm going to check the levels on my headset because I noticed one of the interviews I did the other day, the guest was really quiet, even though here it sounds fine. Right. So we'll just do a quick uh, little check one, two. Yep, I can How's hear that? Can you hear me all right? Is that? Uh, and that is good. Let me just. Levels, okay. Just try that again. Tech so we'll try. Yep, talking, 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 talking about things. Yeah. Perfect. Yeah, I yeah. think that's good. And those watching, just let me know if the levels are balanced and loud enough, etc. Awesome. Well, let's get into it. Yeah. Tell us all about James Roy, author, musician, <laughs> and uh, card-carrying atheist. Would we say that was the... Sure. Yeah, let's say that. The, yeah. if, if you're okay with that. I've yeah, it took me a long time to say that publicly, but yes. Yeah, yeah. So I didn't mean to put you into an no, <laughs> awkward not, position just no, then. It's not awkward at all. Uh, I didn't just out you. No, no, that's good. Yeah. Um, what do you need to know? I mean, look, I, well, I, yeah, it's hard. It's interesting when you start these things and you... I know, and you go, where do you start? Well, you try right. to define people based on certain things, but, I mean, what, what is the defining characteristic right. of a person, I guess? I know, I know. I guess um, what I'd like to to really look into is that childhood growing up within adventism memories good and bad and then how you got into music how you that flowed into being an author mm. and uh, and a successful author as well like uh, you should be really proud of your achievements there but you're right none of the things we do necessarily define us uh, as human beings we're just you know enjoying the sunshine and a coffee overlooking the lake and mm. great conversation so i guess we're just going to have a conversation and then and, and learn a little bit about uh the, the ins and outs of of james roy mm. so may, maybe let's let, i just wanted to read quickly um a couple of the things uh, that i did in the promo blurb um i'll just i'll just read it because that that we can get, give a bit of an outline there of um, some of the the things that you've done but then i want to go back to childhood and and memories of Adventism, because to go from Adventist to atheist is, you know, can be quite a, a, a big uh, journey and one that can shift uh, even their self-identity and knowing who you are and what you are. And ultimately, you've landed in a place where you're, uh, I'm thinking, you know, content and this is you and you've got your ups and downs and normal life challenges but you're probably glad that you've had to taken the journey from Adventism to atheism mm. overall. Well, that's right. I mean, look, I, I guess the first thing I would say is that I'm I'm conscious of the fact that it, it's certainly not the case in Australia as much as it is in, say, the United States. But the the A word, the atheist word, is a is 
is a fairly poisonous word in in some parts of the world and mm. and i know that there are people within the adventist and conservative christian world who hear that word and they draw all sorts of assumptions about what that means and i i mean the the standard definition that you'll usually be given if you're talking to somebody on say a an atheist podcast is they'll say well the term atheism only refers to one question and that is whether or not you're convinced that there is a god it doesn't mean you hold a definite belief that there isn't a god or gods it doesn't mean that you don't believe in nothing it doesn't make you a nihilist it doesn't make any of those things huh. having said that um I, having said that i i think that uh that's a fairly simplistic approach to the term atheist um but i i, I would be at the very from the very top of the show i'd be really keen for people to understand that that when atheists refer to themselves as atheists it doesn't come with all the negative demonic baggage that conservative <laughs> people often ascribe to it yeah um uh, my my i would in fact look atheism is a really easy term to throw around and it does have all these connotations i'd i'd call myself a secular humanist really if i was going to have to be put put myself in some kind of ideological pigeonhole that's probably where i put mm. it um and i would urge anyone who who likes to think that um sorry is that my machine going ping i'm sorry i'll turn that off um yeah, anyone who thinks that just by by terms of by using the word atheist you're you're saying that there is no point to life and that you no. know, i think that that's a really simplistic way of looking at it as well so i'd, I'd like people to understand that yeah and i think it's simply really just a person who is saying look you know i've not been conclusively convinced by any evidence that there is thor or god or a god or mm -hmm. unicorns fairies there's you know you're just you're just not convinced that the evidence is conclusive enough to it's not like a religion but you're no. right it has dark connotations that i think Very are dark, unfairly yeah. uh, tagged to people who who say that you know and i, I mean, think look i would i would add to that though peter that um i think there are there are certain depending on how you define the god that you're talking about there are gods that are logically impossible i think there are gods that can't exist um but uh to say that there is i am absolutely certain there is no god is something that i can't possibly say that would be a yeah. that would be a dishonest thing to say it's more of a scale of plausibility isn't it well dawkins talks about this and i look i think it's a very simplistic way of looking at it as well his scale of but i i see i see belief as being not really so much a left to right one to nine scale um i used to think that if you're going to go from faith to atheism you have to go through agnosticism but agnosticism is a different thing again that isn't even really even on the scale if you're being really serious about it it's a, it's a bit like politics it's not just left and right it's a and it's not just x y it's z as well and so where you sit in that space on and you know i i have atheists i know atheist people who are really awful people i know atheist people who are some of the nicest people i know and the same goes for people of faith and there are there are there are people of faith who believe one thing and others who believe another thing quite opposite so you know it's it's a very complex kind of thing to put a title mm. on i think but for yeah. the purposes of what we're talking about yeah we can <laughs> i went it, from being an adventist to someone who isn't i guess we could say. <laughs> yeah and i think too that sometimes in helping people um take away the darkness and demonization of atheism you have to use simplistic kind of um explanations mm. that then can lead to more nuanced kind of viewpoints yeah i mean that's right i mm. mean the, the one that i i really like which i've heard used many times is when someone says to a a person who, a non-believer they say oh well why don't you just kill yourself because mm. you know you don't believe in anything and i go well there's lots of things i believe in i believe in humanity and i believe in being kind and i believe that we're all in this adventure together and i believe this is not a dress rehearsal you've got to do mm. the best you can now and and then i say but uh if there's no purpose to your life then why are you living it and I go, who says there's no purpose to it mm. and the best mm. example i've heard of this is somebody said um i think i don't remember who it was but they said um i have a car right now and i know one day that car will be scrap heap it'll be on a scrap heap it will be no use it'll be pieces it will be nothing it'll be atoms eventually 
But does that mean that I shouldn't appreciate that car now? It's a car mm. that I've worked hard for and I want to keep it clean and I want to keep it healthy and I want to I want to drive it and use it. And it has utility and it has enjoyment attached to it and all those things. Mm. It doesn't mean that just because one day it's going to be on a scrap heap means that I should just go, well, screw this thing and, and, and drive mm. it into a ditch and leave it behind. You know? Exactly. And I, yeah. That's how I see life. I think life mm. is, is very much like that. Anyway, we're yeah. probably getting way ahead of where we're intended to be. No, no, I like it. That's what these conversations are about. It's just like you and I having a having a coffee. I'll uh, I'll read what I what um, we put there in the promo blurb just to give a bit of a an overview of some of the things you've been doing, and then I want to go back to childhood mm. Adventism, not to try and draw out any um, darkness or anything like that, but I want to look at the pros and the cons of mm. it. Um, and, I, and I've interviewed your dad on the program a couple of times, and I know that he would be, he would see himself as kind of an open minded, progressive Adventist, an apologist for Adventism. And he and I have disagreed on different things, but um, we remain friends, and I really respect him. Um, I was at a funeral yesterday, very sad funeral. A lot of the, the um, people that were, were there were young guys. In you know the early forties, people that I young guys and girls that I remember from when I was at Avondale, and and conversation flowed a little bit um, near the end after the wake and whatnot um, to talking about their experience growing up as Adventists. Many of them weren't Adventists anymore, but they they were talking about some of the positive things there. So I, I've got I'm not trying to suggest that the Adventism has no positive things at all, and people stay or leave. It, it's you know, when they use their own mind, that's what I like is when people are, are not just following like sheep. So I want to kind of dig into that, but I'll, I'll get to reading this now. Um, James Roy is a writer and musician who lives in the Blue Mountains. He was raised in a missionary family and trained as a registered nurse at the Sydney Adventist Hospital before embarking on a writing career that has so far spanned 30 years, 36 books and uh, several major literary awards and a Master of Creative Writing degree from the University of Sydney. He's a, he is a multi-instrumentalist and songwriter and is currently working on an album of songs based on the life and work of Henry Lawson. I will look forward to that one coming out. Um, uh, that'll be a great album. Well, you haven't heard it yet. Uh, uh. <laughs> But I, 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 I appreciate your, your faith. It'll be a great out. Yeah, I, I've got faith. I've got faith in you. Let's define I pre faith. I appreciate you. Exactly. <laughs> I, uh, Ill, play, uh, Ill place confidence, perhaps. Great, in this great doesn't mean good or bad in many ways. It, uh, it'll be a great experience to hold it in my hands if it's the CD and put it Let's on. Let's just say it'll be an experience. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so uh, we'll bring in a couple of comments in, in, a, in a minute that have come up there. But um, first up, let's go back to to young James, earliest memories of Adventism mm. and uh, being in, in family life and church life. Just share some of those kind of memories that come into your mind. Well, you know, I, I, I've been thinking about this in the lead up to this, and it's something that I talk about all, quite often when I'm, when I'm doing um, work in schools or whatever, talking about writing, because the... The my my there's a, the, the things in my life that I value highly were all very much um, supported and formed and and germinated, if you like, in the kind of family life I had. So the fact that I'm a writer really has that's been because of my my upbringing with where story was so important. You know, story was incredibly important in our family in terms of the books we were given because I was a missionary kid, so we read a lot of books. We, My dad, at the time when we, well, I'm going a bit, a bit ahead, but when we lived in Fiji when I was in my, my teen years, um, my dad was doing a um, his master's at that point and he did a unit on children's literature and I remember all his books arrived and they were all great classic books and um, children's books. And I'm confident, I know for a fact that that was one of the things that, and I have moments in that experience that I can pinpoint that really made me want to do this, uh, be a writer. And uh, there was that, and there was the fact that we were, there was no television, so we played a lot, and we played using the books of, that we were reading as as the, uh, if you like, the, the screenplay for our play. Um, 
but also music. I mean, I it's a it's a blessing and a curse that the music that I grew up with was hymns and gospel because while I understand a blues and gospel progression as well as anyone, I think it's really hard to break out of that. And so when I was listening to the song that you had on the on, on the intro and I heard the bridge and it's an interesting little bridge you've got there where you, you've actually modulated completely out of the key you're in and then you've modulated <laughs> back. That's something you'd never hear in a hymn. Mm. And, and the ability to do that is something that I've struggled with and I'm developing as I go. But when I was playing in a band a little while back, we were playing a whole bunch. I was playing bass in a fairly, fairly um, well-known band up here in the mountains and we we're playing regularly. But the, the lead singer would sometimes just go, oh, how about this? Tonight we do um, She Sells Sanctuary by The Cold. And I go, I don't know that song. They go, yeah, you do. It was, you know, 1982. And I go, I don't know that song. And they go, yeah, you do. And I go, I'm telling you as a fact, I do not know that song. I have, better, I have more chance of playing Beethoven's Third than I do of playing She Sells Sanctuary by The Cult because it just isn't something that I ever listen to. So, but that musical, the musical grounding that came about from being exposed to that, you know, it's, it's you're immersed in it every Saturday morning. You, you're immersed in that music and it seeps into your ears until you can hear those progressions to the point where I, I can now parody them because it's it's so so deeply ingrained those gospel mm. progressions. So, but so that the the writing, the fact that we were in some sense isolated socially. Um, living in Papua New Guinea and Fiji, and um, and so you know, I think that that early upbringing. But but the thing about my early upbringing as a as an Adventist was that, and I, I'm conscious of the fact that my parents either are watching this now or will at some point. But I don't know that I ever really truly believed it. I believe I think I believed it in the way that you when you if you grow up in France, you believe that everybody thinks in French. I think it's. I believed in the way, in the sense that if you are, if you were raised in Ireland, you're probably going to go to mass, but it doesn't always impinge on all corners of your life. I mean, it did, but I remember the moment when I, we were, we were I was six, I think six or seven, and we'd just come back from Papua New Guinea, and um, I remember driving through the the town of Bendigo when my great grandfather was living right at the end of his life. And there's a there's a massive spire on the well, there's a massive cathedral there with a spire. It felt massive at the time anyway. I remember the moment really clearly driving past that and seeing the spire on that church. And I remember thinking at that moment, I remember the whole conversation in my head and it went something like this. It went, uh, that's really weird that all those people that go to that church every Sunday and they think that they're right and that the rest of us have almost got it. That's really strange because we're the ones who are right and they're the ones who haven't quite got it. And that moment at the age of seven, it never left me, that 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 thought, you know, because I used to do what we all, I'm sure we all did, where we'd go, why was I born lucky? Why was I so lucky that I was born, that the genetic lottery landed me right in the middle of what's true? <laughs> um and I think at the age of seven, I, I, I kind of subverted that idea and went, well, that, maybe there's a thread here that I need to pull at. And I started pulling mm. at it and I haven't stopped. But yeah. There's something in interviews I've done with other creatives, and it happened to me as well, that if you've got that kind of early bent to kind of stories and music and um, something does happen around the age of seven, I had a similar th feeling walking up College Drive, they used to call it, and mm. just going, boy, how lucky of all the different people. I, I was born into the true church. Mm -hmm. yeah, and, and, then, you, and then you suddenly go, hang on a second. <laughs> yeah, but the funny thing is, Peter, that I don't know that everybody does do that. I mean, I hear this on the podcast I listen to where people ring mm. in and go, and they'll, the host will say to people, assume you're Southern Baptist if you're from Kentucky. And they go, well, yes. Well, why do you think you're Southern Baptist? Well, because it's true. Yeah, but why are you Southern Baptist? Mm, Were mm. your parents Southern Baptist? Yep. What about your grandparents? Yep. What about their great grandparents? Oh, of course. Yeah. Can you not see the connection here? There's, there's something going on here, yeah. right? The apple doesn't fall far from the tree. Well, no. I mean, the fact that all those Mormons in Salt Lake City are Mormons, they don't just, yeah, anyway.
<laughs> I think my my thread I've seen those those that 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 later on are musicians, authors, creatives. They often have that little moment of the why question, mm. that which has just followed the oh how thankful I am that I was born into the truth. Mm. A few other thoughts later. Hang on a second. Um, so yeah, not I'm not saying everybody has it, but I've noticed that quite often the the muso um, storyteller relates that in 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 these conversations I have with people. Yeah, for sure, absolutely. So yeah, that was um you know being being sent as a as a fam we, we were sent to Papua New Guinea when I was ten months old, so I don't really remember anything before that, but I do remember Papua New Guinea very clearly, and I know that my parents. I was talking to dad about the mum and dad about this just a couple of days ago. And, um, you know, dad was, dad said that when they were asked to go to this school in the middle of the Western Highlands or Central Highlands of Papua New Guinea, they didn't even think to say, have you ever done any agriculture? Do you know anything about gardening? Do you know anything about, um, not even mental health, you know anything about the most basic health care because you're going to have to run the dispensary out there. Do you, do you know anything about, anything do you know anything about tractor maintenance house maintenance <laughs> you know do you know anything he said we weren't even asked it was just yeah. assumed that we would just go and do it yeah Learn so, you you know, I, yeah so I, I i grew up around a family that did that and I, I the funny thing though about we're talking about this too the there was a lady called mrs um palmer who lived in in uh in Sono at Sonoma near us and which is the second part place we went to in Papua New Guinea and I used to regularly sneak out she had these old she had this record player with these records they were basically the audio, the equivalent of audio books they were little records with with stories on them I don't don't remember if they were like bedtime story style things or whether they were nursery nursery tales or whatever but she had these records and I used to sneak out without telling because i knew my mum would say no so i'll just sneak out and I was, I was like five four or five and i'd go over to mrs palmer and i'd knock on the door and she'd invite me in and i'd sit there on the i remember really clearly sitting there on the floor listening to these records and and then there'd be a knock at the door and it'd be my mum going is, is is james here and like oh yes he, did he not tell you he was coming over no come on let's go but she never i don't remember her ever scolding me for it which I, I think maybe she just understood that this idea this fascination with story was something that yeah, shouldn't be shouldn't be argued with yeah yeah don't want to suppress it no and i know yeah. a lot of people who were i mean I, I know a lot of people in in my in my cohort at avondale high school a number who probably who may well have gone on and done incredible things creatively certainly sports wise i was, I was listening to the interview you did with um um andy hall and the whole idea that you know, I know a number of people who, whose sporting careers were. There's one in particular. I, I won't say who, but but he was invited to the, um, to the uh, cricket academy when Shane Warne was there, and he couldn't go because he was Seventh Day Adventist mm. and he knew he'd have to play cricket on Saturday, mm. and that sort of thing. And 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 I know there are people who are creatives who who may well have gone. Far. Mm. And I remember a prominent a prominent um, personality from Avondale College one time. He was talking to me about my. He, we ran into a, I ran into him and his family at a music festival one day, and I I had I think three books out at this point, and he said to me very you know much older than me, he said um, so who are you published by? And I said um, oh, Penguin and Random House. And, and UQP, and he said, oh, well, Hodder and Stoughton is a good publisher. I said, you're absolutely right. They're a very good publisher. He said, you should publish with them. I said, well, I'm with Penguin. I'm, I'm okay with, with that. And then he said, but I've got one word of advice for you, young man. And I immediately bristled because I was at this stage I was 30-something. And he said, um, use less, le less bad language in your books, and then you will be better positioned to make the most of the Adventist market. And I didn't know how to break the news to this man that the Adventist market was not something that I was trying to break into. Mm. Um, I'd been published in, in the record. I, I'd done that. I didn't want to do that again. I wanted to, I had, it sounds awful, but I had bigger fish to fry. I wanted to, I wanted my voice to be heard beyond the confines of 
the world I really was most familiar with. Yeah. So, yeah, anyway. I don't yeah, know. I'm, I'm rambling a bit, I know. No, but... it's interesting because um, part, part of Adventist culture fails to see outside of it. Like when I left and it took a couple of years, I, I was surprised how I felt I'd lost my identity because my identity mm. had been wrapped up in the church so much um even though like you i felt i felt quite early on that i wasn't actually an adventist that i was just wearing an adventist coat mm. uh, and i think music really helped because i you know i'd stumbled across Jimi hendrix and um, credence and these kind of bands that i i, I f sort of fell into another community community of guitar players i guess mm. um and so leaving i found this kind of identity um crisis uh, but when i came to terms with that i remember driving into sydney as you come down that hill towards either the tunnel or the bridge and you can see the harbour bridge and yep. and the city looked bigger to me and and this is what you know age 55 56 or whatever and i i thought whoa what why does it just look huge to me now i think because i'd kept my mind in the adventist bubble you're coming into the city and you're going to go and sing at such and such a church on the other mm. side of the bridge and you're just thinking of the church and the, and the community that you'll be sharing with it, it, and and this guy that you spoke to in his mind of course you want to reach the adventist community because in his mind that's the biggest bubble mm. well yeah i mean and i I guess another example of what you're describing is, and I'm I, I'm 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 acutely aware of the fact that things are probably very different from when I was at school. I was I was in I was at Avondale in a really daggy period of the eighties. I mean, everything was daggy in the eighties, but Avondale was pretty 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 specially daggy. Daggy. What fact. years were you at Avondale? Uh, at Avondale, oh, uh, we came back from Fiji at the beginning of eighty three. So I, I did year nine, ten, eleven, twelve through eighty three to eighty six. So. And then I went straight to Avondale to do nursing after that. But, mm. but um, yeah, I, I, we I remember we played cricket against two schools. We either played against the Hamilton and Adventist School, or we played against Strathfield. I was just going to say Strathfield, yeah. And I remember one time one of the teachers put put in some work and got us a baseball game against Cessnock High. Now Cessnock is a hotbed of baseball. We didn't even know what, how the game worked. Trashed. It was incredible. Oh, it was, look, there are so many stories I could tell you. But but the point is that then when I came to Sydney to work, go to the sand, and I'll, I'll talk about that in a while, I guess, but went to the sand and all these private schools there, and they all play against a different school every weekend. Mm -hmm. And I thought, this world's rather larger than I thought it was. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But, you know, the, the, thing, the thing I will say, though, based on, you know, based on something you said a moment ago, I manage the drum department at a music shop and I had this young guy come in the other day and he's a he's a fairly what's the word? He's a he's a rather smug, arrogant young man, very self-confident, very young, but he and very well groomed. And he he said he hadn't I said have you been playing much? And he said, Oh, just at church. And I said, Okay, well, which church? And he told me. And I said, Oh, when I when I was when I went was a kid, when I was your age. If even so much as a drum kit found its way onto the stage of the church, the, the oldies would lose their minds. And he said, Oh, what church was that? And I said, Seventh day Adventist. And he says, Oh, so not real Christian then. <laughs> and my response really surprised me. I felt my I felt my hackles rise. Interesting. And I said, it might, I said, even if it is a cult, it's my cult. And then I thought, wow, I haven't identified as Seventh Day Adventist for a long time, but I immediately felt some kind of defensiveness. Interesting. Yeah, it was. And I came yeah. home, I was quite shaken by it. I came home and I said to Vic, said to my wife, I said, Today I argued for Adventism. I said, I don't even understand <laughs> why or how, but I just did. And I and I, I just I educated him a little bit. I said, What you've just done is something called a no true no, no true Scotsman fallacy. I said, and I don't I said I'm a little bit he said, "Well, don't they believe in?" I said, "Just stop. If you don't, if you have to ask, then you don't know already. So mm. don't make assumptions about." I said, "What?" And then he and then he sort of went, "Well, you know, how do you know that's true?" And I, I sensed he was going down the presuppositional route. And I said, "You're going to go presupp on me, aren't you?" He said, "Well, how do you know that to be true?" And I said, 
I haven't got time for a presuppositional argument today. Nobody does. <laughs> <laughs> I haven't got an hour to waste listening to you try and tell me that only God can tell us what re what truth is. <laughs> that is interesting. I just did a, a um, reaction video to a Ted Wilson video. That's a, His video is about 10 minutes long. My reaction video is about an hour and a half. <laughs> But uh, he, he um, might be a lot uh, shorter than that. <laughs> in uh, the title is something like uh, Ted uh, Ted Wilson is a real Seventh Day Adventist, uh, and I had that kind of response of people very triggered. What gives you the right to say that? And I'm a real Adventist, and and um, uh, you know part part of some of the things I do, I just say to to help create a conversation because I think the dialogue is important. Um, but, but, uh, yeah, isn't that interesting that you, well, you suddenly became, you know, a, a triggered response? Yeah. I wasn't ever going to be an apologist, but I also was going to, I wanted to say to this guy, hang on, just cool your jets here a bit, buddy. You don't, you know, but the funny thing about the, you know, the Ted Wilson thing is that I was thinking about this on the drive. I did some music last night. I was driving home. I was thinking about our, our conversation today and, and I kind of anticipated this part of the com conversation where I thought, you know, why do I care? what happens in the Adventist world. And the reason I care, there's two reasons. Firstly, because it is my heritage. I mean, you're much more versed in the history than I am, but, you know, it is part of my heritage. There are still a lot of friends and family who are still involved. But but more importantly, I don't, I don't, I actually don't care from how the Adventist church is affected by the decision on whether women are ordained or not. I literally couldn't care less. What I care about is the women I know who do believe, who would love to be allowed to be mm. pastors. I care about them. I care about the fact that there are women who are being, no woman should ever be told you can't do anything mm. just because they you're a woman. 100%, yeah. That's, that's a secular humanist perspective, and mm. I know a lot of Christians also share that perspective. That's my perspective. So the reason I care about what things Ted Wilson says and not because I care about what Ted Wilson says, I care about the knock-on effects they have of mm. people that I care about and people mm. I don't even know who I know are being affected by this. Mm. It's just not, it's not on. It's no. simply not on. Mm. And I will, I'll shout that from the rooftops. If yeah. anybody who stands in the way of a woman or anyone doing anything on the basis of their gender or anything like that, mm. screw that guy. No, mm. no, no, no. I mean, that's that's why I left. That was the catalyst. I'm sitting there, you know, being the older dad that I am, I'm sitting there with Renee on my lap, aged maybe three, um, and I'm watching the on, on YouTube <laughs> just late one night, the no vote and it going through, and I just thought, so if my daughter grew up you know, in the church and she wanted to certain get certain jobs within the church, she couldn't get them. Uh, and it turns out of about 30 high position jobs in the Adventist church, 10 are unavailable to women because of their gender and their, their um, not being allowed to be ordained. And mm. I just, I just simply thought I looked at her and I thought, I can't put my name to this anymore. And, you know, she's 11 now and the church has still got that stance, which I think is not a theological one. It's an ethical one. So that was my little lightning rod moment. I just can't put my name to that anymore. No, no, that's right. I mean, yeah, that wasn't my lightning rod moment, but I understand why it was yours. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. And, and you're following a similar thread there where one thing that you care about is, in, you know, you're not worried about the big picture of what Ted or Ted doesn't do, but what he says has a direct impact to women you know. And women I don't know. Yeah, yeah, to, to women, to the whole concept well, of To all of us. To, 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 to humanity. Yeah. yeah, exactly right. Yeah, I mean it's it's very, it's it's, it's it kind of strikes me as kind of rather hypocritical that you know people who will vote against women being afforded the right to be clergy will roll their eyes when conversations about priests comes up, Catholic priests. Yeah, they'll try yeah. and pass some reason as to why the things happen to Catholic Church. Now they'll often come down to well, if they let them marry, or if they let women be priests, and I think. Are you not yeah, listening to what you're saying? I know, I know, very, I know. The cognitive dissonance is very yeah. real. Yeah. Um, that makes me think of two things. One, 
and I've observed this since the 2015 no vote. So we're coming up to to uh, nearly nearly 10 years. Incredible. It still seems so fresh. Um, why do you think a lot of people within the church, they they talk about how terrible it is, but they don't really speak up about it? Like, why, why is there a silence when that, to what we're saying, is obviously unethical? Mm-hmm. Um, why... Why not a bigger reaction? Like I know, I remember. I think in Norway in the early seventies, uh, there was some kind of government suppression of women. This is the, the inaccurate paraphrasing. Mm. Uh, seventy one, seventy three, something like that. And the women effectively put a strike on together and just stopped at, at a secular level. Um, you know, uh, supporting the government in all sorts of ways that that women do. Um, and within a year, the, the the laws were changed and they achieved equality way faster than a lot of places in the world, or at least the pathway to a more uh, um, equal opportunity kind of situation. Why, why do you think Adventists... I, I noticed when I did a lot of um, programs on this topic, the biggest pushback I got was from progressive Adventist women. Really? The very people that were being suppressed were the most angry with me stop attacking our leaders it'll happen in god's time you've just got an axe to grind you're just bitter real venomous attacks the most attacks came from the progressive women that were being affected by the no vote the most i think that i don't know but i I suspect that's a bit of projection where they're they want i'm sure they they want those changes to happen but they're fearful about the repercussions if, if if they defend it if they push that agenda too strong they're not saying they're going to be persecuted in any way but um yeah the thought i had in my head a moment ago was a much clearer version of what i just said as you're speaking but no, look I, I i don't know i um it's it is peculiar to me but but the as we've seen by looking at churches and organizations that are similar in some ways to Adventism, like, um, let's say, the Jihad as Witnesses. And I know that people, the, the comments are probably going to light up right now when I say that, but hear me out. Uh, these reasonably exclusive um, organisations and faiths, um, they're very good at pushing people to one side if they feel that the status quo is being challenged. And I think it's fearfulness. Um it's I, I saw what happened. I mean, we've you've talked at great length and I know a little bit about it, but the 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 um the Desmond Ford thing. I mean, when people talk about Desmond Ford, I go, What? Why? What? And I think we should we need to be kind of grateful and, and appreciative of the fact, and I said this to my dad the other day, we need to be appreciative of the fact that if this was happening in the fifteen hundreds, people would be burning at the stake. Like the the glacier view thing was tantamount yeah. to a, a you know he would have been burnt at the stake he would have been beheaded yeah. it would have been thomas more all over again yeah, yeah. You know? exactly yeah and um that, that sort of bothers me um that anyway I, i'm rambling because i'm trying to capture thoughts about what i was going to say but yeah. uh yeah no no it's good but it's to be honest good. with you I, I really haven't thought too much about that vote apart to think well, that seems absurd to me that women would vote against, because I, I, you're right. Women voted against their own best interest in that. And yeah, I, I, I'll just bring up. Um, this is Clancy Rogers, who I really value her thoughts and opinions, and she's watching. And she's just mentioned some progressive women didn't want to get spoken over and spoken for. And I remember during that time, because I was jumping in and you know, agitating in many ways and stirring the pot and 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 calling people out for well you know you're not you should be speaking up more this kind of thing which was a bit brash and naive you know and so what what i do value with what uh, clancy says there um not only spoken over but spoken for Mm. and i was that person that was coming in and speaking over everybody and um speaking for them and so i pulled back because a lot of great people like clancy 
you know. Yeah, I think that's a really told, valid, told me that. valid response. They told, yeah, 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 they told me that. And I thought, yeah, wow, I am doing that. And so I suddenly respected their situation a lot more. And a lot of women said to me behind the scenes that they felt shame in talking about it publicly and they felt worried about the judgment of other people on them. Men kind of, I'm being very generalizing here, but um, for whatever reason, <clears throat> men often find themselves <clears throat> not really worried about that kind of thing, but um, women are way more able to, again, for whatever reason, um, well, if we're be if, more considerate of other people around them in conversations that could be very um, dividing, divisive. Look, I would say that industrial action would be very effective. And by industrial yeah. action, I mean if uh, in the very traditional, and again, I haven't been really circulating in Adventist circles very much for some years, but certainly looking at the, the world that I, I did occupy when I, when I was SDA, um, if the if the women in the church had stopped doing the stuff that they did, the whole place would have ground to a halt. Say that uh, again, sorry. If if, if the if the women if the women in the church had stopped doing the the duties oh, yeah. that they were given, um, and <laughs> had industrial action in something as simple as that, the whole thing yeah. would have ground to a halt. Immediately. Yeah. Oh yeah. I I said just um, uh, go and sit in the foyer, <laughs> sit in the in the cry room. Don't be involved with any potluck lunches. Uh, immediately yeah. stop your tithing, and mm. of course those those were seen as a little bit too uh, too a stronger approach. But anyway, that, yeah. it's it's fascinating, and I I'm not even saying I've drawn conclusions there. I'm open to people talking more about it. I think it's great. Way back, I said there were two things that came to mind when we were talking about. Um, um, that feeling of why I left, that was my, for me personally, holding my daughter, being an older dad. You know, if oh. I'd been a younger dad with a young daughter, I probably would have stayed in the church. If I'd been, um, you know, if they'd been grown up and I was the age I am and, and uh, I probably would have just stayed as well. I, I, I kind of was able to kind of tease apart the, well, I don't really believe that, but I'm part of the culture. Um, but there was something about that moment of just holding a little girl baby Mm. That just really blew my mind. But the second thing, and this is what I wanted to ask you, uh, I then went, wow, you know, the, this um, sanctuary doctrine, the investigative doctrine, this stuff is, yeah, I've never really believed it. But as I dug into why, why don't I believe that? Because I just, you know, I like exploring things. I thought this is an absolute crazy doctrine that's not only just not really gospel it's kind of anti-gospel if you really look at it it's it's not biblical at all and it reminded me of when i was that seven and eight again i, I had these nightmares of tr the time of trouble and probation closing and standing without an intercessor i'm just yeah. interested did you have those kind of um borderline nightmare oh of course I mean, the whole project sunlight thing and all that stuff yeah of course mm. um I, I do remember, though, I remember when I was um, in high school and going to Avondale College Church, I remember thinking one day when somebody stood up with this sort of breathless announcement that, and they got an overhead projector and threw up something on the screen and it was some half-assed news report from some tin pot republic in, in the Balkan or somewhere, and it said uh, something about they were planning to bring in a Sunday law. But it wasn't put in those terms. It was like, you know, people were going to be encouraged or whatever. I can't remember. But it was really, and it was presented as being, here is proof positive that the sun, that a Sunday law is taking hold. And there, I looked around. I remember looking around at all the people in the church and, and many of them had horrified faces. They, they, the colour had drained from their faces and I could just imagine them all working out how many cans of nut meat they were going to need to run to the Wadigans with, right? <laughs> My grandma was convinced that the ring, mm -hmm. I think she was joking. I hope she was, but she was convinced that they put the ring pull on the nut meat can in case we all forgot our can openers. Can right? openers. What against, oh. yeah, yeah. But, um, <laughs> it but was, I remember. It, whether that's true or not, I do remember thinking, hey, that's handy. <laughs> yeah, that's right. 
<laughs> yeah, so anyway, I, I looked around at these people and the the look of horror and terror on their faces and I, I kind of thought, that's really strange because this is what we've been waiting for. We're waiting for the time of trouble so things can get on with it. God can get on with it, you know, and we've just been told that it's happening and you guys all look terrified. I'm thinking, shouldn't we be on the, up on the pews celebrating? Like, yeah. Seriously. Yeah. And I thought, is this is this wish fulfillment or is it, you know, something else? I don't know. I think they're worried about whether they'd be able to stand true without the intercessor for that few weeks or months that was just ahead as well. Maybe. I don't even know if they thought about that that deeply. I, 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 I can't tell you. I don't know. I wasn't them. But um, I just I remember it being a bit odd, jarring as I thought, you know, yeah. well, shouldn't this be a source of We should be rejoicing. celebrating kind of thing. Yeah, yeah, exactly. yeah. Exactly. yeah. Uh, yeah, because often when I did my program about this, you know, Ted Wilson is a real Seventh-day Adventist, people were saying to me, oh, Pete, that's not my experience. Oh, that wasn't my experience. Oh, you know, I'm like, well, you know, I, I haven't spoken to an Adventist yet that hasn't had some kind of moment like you're just relaying there where, you know, they experience some kind of fear about the time of trouble and close of probation and and you know the, there's something about adventism with that particular doctrine that brings a kind of a fear that i think is a little bit um dangerous but then again so is the 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 um the belief in hell that that scares people after death as well maybe it's something that people like to do to kids is just scare them into some kind of conformity <laughs> so they'll be better um better sheep in the in the society mm -hmm. It's a, I think it's a poisonous idea, and um, mm, yeah, anyway. mm. uh, and I and I think both of them are. Uh, let's go to a couple of these uh, thoughts and questions that have been up. Now, there's a few comments here where people are saying um, we're getting a bit trolled. So my advice is just, if you personally don't like someone making comments, just block them uh, or ignore one hundred percent. Angela Lima. Hey, Angela, good to have you watching today. She has written the so-called gospel Adventists better get ready to leave this church if they want to follow the true gospel. Do you, do you think someone like your father and, and people of his era, my, my parents, um, those that kind of were a little bit more aligned with the Des Ford theology, do you think they would call themselves progressive Adventists, gospel Adventists? I'm reluctant to speak for any of them. It's not my journey. Yeah, yeah. Hmm. But do you, well, perhaps let me rephrase that. Do you kind of see in the church um, a distinct difference between those who um, we would call, like when you and I were growing up and you were much younger than me, but there was, you know, Fordites and CBs, the concerned brethren, hmm. and there's nuanced versions of that still to this day and I think have always been floating around Adventism. Um, but there seems to be a group that's more open to progress, change, different styles of worship. Um, I'm not talking about standards or, you know, being liberal, conservative po politically. I'm talking about theologically speaking. Um, do you see, as you kind of look back on Adventism, uh, when you reflect on when you were an Adventist, were you aware of these kind of two groups that one side definitely had a, a sense of, you know, uh, a more fundamental approach to the Adventist doctrines being implemented and the other group was more okay with, hey, let's, you know, live and let live and be a bit more accepting well, about this. I remember when I was, when we were living in Melbourne, so this is before we went to Fiji, um, sort of 76, 77, 78, something like that, 77. Um, I remember that was, I remember my father having long and reasonably frenzied conversations in the car park after church with various people. And mm, mm. we just all have to sit dutifully in the car while mum rolled her eyes and worried about her gluten steaks going cold. Um, <laughs> while dad had these conversations. And I, I sensed then that there was something big going on. I heard the names Fordite thrown around. I knew that to call someone a Fordite was tantamount to calling them a Catholic. I don't know. It was, it was pretty, it was pretty full on. Yeah. Um, oh, yeah. I remember, but I, I never really got that much into it. And, and you are, you're asking me about stuff that like, I'll be honest with you, Peter, the last time I was 
apart from when I went and sang in the choir a couple of times for my father at um, at Memorial, and I think the last time I was in an Adventist church was when actually I went for my 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 nephew Bailey's baptism at Castle Hill, and that was kind of I found that challenging because the last time I had the previous time I'd willingly been in an Adventist church was my last because of something that was said in that church. And I don't remember the name of the pastor. I wouldn't say who it was if I did remember, because I, I don't, it's going to sound like I'm being immensely critical. And I am to be fair, because I remember in the, uh, we were, my wife and I, we were you know, 20 in our early twenties. We were freshly married. And I remember sitting in the balcony at Castle Hill church and, um, the minister said in his prayer, and I remember the words like they burn into my, my skull. He said, Lord, protect us this week as we return to our workplaces and are contaminated by those around us. Very interesting. And I looked at Vic and Vic looked at me and I said, no. And she said, no. And we stood up and we walked out in the middle of the service, never went back. Wow. How old were you at that point? Uh, we were in our early 20s. Wow. Because um, that's not compatible with the person I want to be. Yeah. I I knew that we'd been raised as, you know, there are two kinds of people. There are Adventists and non-Adventists, and there are good people in both camps and all the rest. But for this person to define everyone who wasn't within that bubble that we were in as being something that would contaminate us, it felt icky. It felt wrong and mm. i know there'll be people in the comments now saying well you know you can't you shouldn't judge the church by the people but if you can't mm. judge a church by the people <laughs> what are you going to judge it by because yeah. as far as i can tell the only evidence we have about any of this stuff is what people have told us mm. the the only evidence we have for the bible is what people have written down the only evidence we have for god is what people claim the only mm. evidence we have for how people should behave is how they behave <laughs> the only evidence we have for any of this is the contacts we have with the physical world and people are part of the physical world. Mm. I don't buy into the supernatural world. I believe I'm a, nat I'm a naturalist, not a naturist. That's a different thing. I yeah. do wear clothes at the beach. But, <laughs> but um, yeah, and people, I've heard it so many times, people doing that whole, once again, the no truth the Scotsman thing, they go, oh, yeah, but, you know, that wasn't a really Christian thing to say. No, but he was a representative of that church and mm. he, was, he was on the payroll to speak and make people feel better about their mm. faith and to understand their faith and to feel closer to God and to make their journey, for whatever that means, make their journey better. Mm. And he screwed the pooch horribly on that. He basically, he, he said, go out into the world and sneer at everyone. Mm, mm, and mm. I refuse to be part of a world like that. Mm. And I know it's not everybody. I know there are churches that that isn't the case. But I was already on the edge, and that was enough. That pushed mm. me because I was at the sand at that point. And and I went to the I went to do nursing because in the nineteen eighties at Avondale, you oftentimes your options were fairly limited. If you were super smart, you went and did law or medicine. But if you're just an average Joe like I was. You either did nursing or ministry or business or teaching. They were kind of the main options. Now, I probably should have done teaching, but my dad didn't enjoy teaching, and I'd sort of learnt from him that maybe I shouldn't do that. And funnily enough, since I've become a writer, it's a large part of what I do is working in schools. So I think I could have been a good teacher, but I didn't do that. And I don't think I would have enjoyed being a career teacher. I certainly didn't want to go into the ministry because I was, you know, I just, I just didn't, I just didn't. <laughs> um, I'm terrible with numbers, so I didn't really want to do the business thing. That seemed like a, a life of torture, a, a life with a calculator. My God, that what what is this weird sorcery of which they speak maths? I don't get this. But, um, and so I went and did nursing. And so I went, and the reason I did nursing, knowing what I know now, I probably would have gone and done English at, one of the unis and and but i mean creative writing degrees weren't a thing then i didn't really know that that's what i wanted to do um but i went and did nursing and and, and counterintuitively that's what led me out of this way of thinking because i, I went to be a nurse believing that this was the best the safest place for me to do it because i could 
I would be at the San. I would be around Adventists. I would be protected. I would be at the, at the in the residence. I would still have a little bit of that kind of contact with the big Sydney world because being an Avondale kid, it was like there was the, the Strathfield kids and then we were the country bumpkins. Yeah. So I thought I could be part of this and I came down and discovered the Sydney Adventists were worse than we were. You know, it was all that stuff. So, yeah. So we didn't, um, so I, I thought I'll do nursing. That's a nice, safe option. I can I can still serve the Lord and I can do all those things and remain around Adventists. And I got down there and suddenly I was expected to work on Saturday and that was okay. I was getting paid to work on Saturday. That was conflicting, but that was also okay. I had to buy a meal ticket to buy my meal on a Saturday. That's okay. I could get around that. Um, but the big thing was that most of the people that I was working with as a most of my clients, if you like, most of my patients were not adventists. And I very quickly learned that it doesn't matter whether you're a high court judge or the guy or a bus driver or a teacher or a gardener or whatever you do, when your kids are ill, you're scared. When you are dying and you have been told by the doctor that you have a limited period, you're scared that you reach out to people, that you reach out to your family, and that it didn't matter what faith you were from. Sure, you might call a chaplain, but at the end of the day, when the chaplain left, you were still as terrified as you'd begun. And I learned really quickly that being part of the Adventist world in that setting didn't actually change much. Mm. It was just, that was just the infrastructure, the, the scaffolding over which this, I mean, health is, Health is trying to hold inevitability at bay. That's what we do. Mm. And we're getting better at doing it. But at the end of the day, everything is just temporary while we, while eventually we die. And I know that sounds nihilistic and I'm, I'm not a nihilist at all. I'm a realist. And everything we do is, is sort of holding that stuff at bay. And so being in, and that was kind of what made me start to go, all these people that I met from all over the place who are patients and whatnot, doctors and other nurses and so forth, it really started to remind me that, or to show me that I wasn't special by virtue of being Adventist. I was just somebody who had a slightly different belief. And then when we went to Castle and Church and this guy said what he said, I immediately thought about all the people I would have to be in contact with that week. And I thought, yeah. I don't think I'm being contaminated by, by people. I'm not helping them out of pity. I'm helping them because they're people. Yeah. And um, that was a really jarring moment for both of us. And I'm, I'm really glad that Vic and I both, because she was she was a, she was Adventist as well, and she took a lot longer to. Um, I don't want to speak for her in terms of where she is now, but she certainly has taken a much longer journey out. She she did some multi faith stuff, and she did some. She did what a lot of people did: went to the Eastern kind of, you know, the meditation, all that stuff, and and uh, I just went, no, I, I think that I'm done now, mm. and I, I just I don't think I've ever. I've ever really properly believed this anyway. And I know that that may well be hurtful to people who are close to me who hear me say that. And I don't mean it to be hurtful. No. Um, so much of all the good things in my life have come from the family I've come from. Mm. Um, I just, I didn't, I didn't go along with that. Yeah. Yeah. I'm glad. Thanks for unpacking your experience there with doing the nursing, because that even highlights more profoundly that moment for, for you when that, when that person did the prayer and, and suggested you know when you go out there and get contaminated you're, well, that, you're that's already a, that's working a horrible on, word isn't it? i know yeah and you were you were already working with people that were all kinds of backgrounds it's interesting when uh, christians will claim that they are the body of christ we are his hands we are his voice we are his legs you know the um it, implying that yeah it is our responsibility to to show this better um world view uh and yet as soon as you quite rightly get to say hey that 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 really made me kind of question my faith when that person said that it, then it's like oh well hang on you know not all christians are like that which is not what you're saying no not at all and and you know i mm. there's nothing that a sick that a nothing good that a, a person of faith can do that someone who is of a secular mindset can't, mm. can't do as well. I think that's something that's often thrown at atheists is this idea mm. that, well, you know, but, you know, 
there's a guy that I met on Facebook one time. I don't even remember his name because I, I forgot it fairly quickly on purpose. Um, but he was a, he was a very ultra conservative seventh day Adventist. And it's two, two, and I, I don't go on Facebook anymore, but I, I was pretty active with it for a while because I was going, I guess I was going through my angry phase that we all go through. And he said a couple of things that really bothered me. At one point he said something about his, it was, I think it was when the, the same sex plebiscite was happening. And he was saying, you know, if my father and my kids, no, he was talking about gay people and, you know, they should be cast out and all this stuff. And I noticed that he had two kids, young kids. And so I said to him, look, I'm really hoping that if you were, if one of your two kids were to come to you and say, Dad, I think I might not be attracted to people the way you expect. I'm actually attracted to people in a different way that you would sit down and go, okay, well, let's try and understand that and that you would tell them you would support them in any way you could. He said, no, I'd throw them out immediately. Wow. I said, well, I'm giving you an out here, mate. I'm trying to let you know that, you know, it's you're in a safe space to say, yes, my kids come first. He said, but they don't. Oh, boy. And then he doubled down on that. And he said to me, um, he said, because, you know, it's on the Ten Commandments. I said, well, it's actually not in the Ten Commandments, but sure. <laughs> and then he said, um, he, he said, if it wasn't for the Ten Commandments, everybody would be out raping, murdering and stealing. Hmm. I said, so I'm going to ask you directly, if you didn't go to church every week, would you be out raping, murdering and steering? He said, yes, I would. I said, then in the name of all that's holy, please don't stop going to church. We don't want you on the street. We don't want a psychopath like you loose on the street. Yeah. But what are you talking about? It's just insane. Hmm. Anyway. So. I, uh, it's interesting. Uh, you were probably, I don't, I'm not, I don't know for sure, but it, uh, it's great. Peter Veach is watching and, and he also did. Oh, hi, Peter. Too, I yeah. think. And uh, he's made a couple of good comments we'll come to later. Um, and I highly recommend that people go, if they're interested in robust conversations like that, which you just spoke of, uh, go and join SDA Fight Club. And I think he's streaming it there live for us today oh, right no. now. So welcome all those from... Uh, yeah, well, this is, this is one of the few... That's one of the, one of the apart from my family, the really the people I still haven't have a lot of contact with are my um, a couple of friends from school, but uh, also uh, an ex Adventist group that meets in Sydney semi regularly, and um, oh, we just sit around and and, and and talk. I mean, I the whole table had to kind of take a breath the other night because someone asked me how my grandma passed away, and I said she had a a gluten embolus and had a stroke on a gluten embolus and and which is that's it was a throwaway line and she would have found that funny i hope but um <laughs> oh, the whole table was like that's yep yeah. it's not something you could say to a group of any other people and have them understand what you meant and knew what you meant but, yeah. Yeah. yeah yeah they can get the uh the dark humor like I can, if you, you, talk, you go out in the general community and you talk about turning up on vet to vespers after the pot luck with some gluten steaks, yeah, and some haystacks, they're not going to know what you're talking about. No, that's that's no, another language. No. That's like matzo balls and and um, you know. Yeah. Anyway, I know, I know. I was listening to a um, podcast the other day on health, and and the lady said it was I think it was live. So it might have been a YouTube live show, and she was saying what what's the number one worst thing you can intake into your body. And uh, people were saying sugar, and she said, no, no, gluten. <laughs> I don't know how true that is. You'd know more than me on that. Well, I, I've always wondered whether mm. German Adventists greet, greet each other with gluten tart. <laughs> oh, I love it. Uh, I want to just talk one last little bit about your dad and your mum, um, and you've got a brother and sister who I know as well, lovely people, lovely family. I. Um, have nothing but warm memories and thoughts and kind words to say about them. I remember working with your dad on a, I think it was a Welsh choir, the Sydney Welsh mm. choir. He'd organised them to do a concert and I remember really wanting to capture it, you know, so I brought along 24, this is back before I had the, um, it all on computer, but it was a literal 24-track digital recording desk mm. and I had, I think, something like, nine or ten at least ten cameras all over the place and uh the church was packed 
And and I remember just thinking, wow, I had a, such a great experience working with your dad. He he was organized, efficient, well spoken. Nothing ruffled his feathers during the whole thing. And it's a massive operation. This is like the full on Sydney Welsh Choir. The whole of the Memorial Church had flowers around everywhere nicely. The big camera and audio kind of part of it. And all the ca- um, all the ca- all the flowers are put there by women. Remember. That's right. Yes, yes. It might have been in conjunction with the Spring Festival or something like that. Right. Uh, but it was a team effort for sure and one that he he was overseeing. But I never felt that he was being um, authoritarian or anything like that. And um, I find that kind of person quite rare. Um, have you valued your mother and father in the sense of, like you said, when they went out to the mission fields, here mm. we go, uh, you've got to be a farmer, or you've got to be a handyman, you've got to suddenly take on these things. Uh, and I'm not even suggesting it's an Adventist thing. I, I kind of mm. think, it, think of it as a unique human individual thing. And I, I've seen your mum and dad kind of work together um, it, it, with you know, with this kind of thing, did you see that as you were growing up? Just as a kind of a side, really, it's yeah, not even no. anything critical. I'm just, I, I just want to highlight that I, I, I I'm amazed by the the things he's done and, no, well, and the teamwork that yeah. your mother and he kind of put put out there. Well, I mean, look, I look at it this way, and I've, of course, at the time, I wasn't really, um, I wasn't really processing the sacrifices being made by them and i don't mm. know if the sacrifices that i would be prepared to make i mean taking your family out to somewhere like the central highlands in new guinea in the late 60s that's a terrifying idea and um yeah yeah when I, mean, I struggle to take my kid on a roller my grandkid on a roller coaster because i'm scared they're going to be frightened you know so yeah <laughs> to pack the kids up halfway through the year and, and i know that it caused my dad at some at some time it must have caused him some kind of envy to watch all the all his colleagues from when he was teaching for the state um all retire at the age they did and he was still working yeah working yeah. hard and oftentimes not feeling terribly appreciated and and you know just yes the the sacrifices that were made and yes there are rewards that come with that but i remember also when we came back from when we came back from Papua New Guinea and we were at Lilydale, Dad was the, the deputy preceptor at Lilydale, and and he talks about that quite openly as being a fairly difficult time in his life, and and Mum's as well. But I remember one year we had all these bicycle handlebars, racing bike handlebars, all over the lounge room, and they were Mum and Dad were wrapping the the um, the handlebars with the the grip. And I didn't even for a moment think that this was something they were doing for money. I thought they were just doing it for fun. And of course, times are tough. And they were, do, they, there was a family at our church who owned a, a bike shop and they were wrapping these things for them. Wow. The Wilson yeah. family, they were doing that for them. And that's, you know, when you, and for me, I kind of got a, a little glimpse of this myself when we'd been to Fiji for, a number of years and I'd come back and we came back to Avondale and I, I felt grateful that I'd come back to a place where my, my friends still were. But at the same time, this is in year nine, but at the same time, it was a bit jarring because when I'd left, when we'd left to go to Fiji, there'd been a real, I don't know, if there was a, some sort of zeitgeist in the church at the time or certainly in Avondale about missionaries and how revered they were and appreciated and valued. We came mm. back and it was just almost like nobody, like, oh, you've been away. We hadn't even yep. noticed kind of thing. Yeah, yes. Yeah, and so yeah. The, the, that period of arrested development that I'd been in over those three years, yeah, um, it, was a, yeah. it was an interesting time to be away from Australia because that's a, they're very formative, those years, years six, seven, eight. Yeah. Um, but no, I, I think that it has been a, a difficult journey at times for my parents in terms of, I mean, it's it's not hard. It's not easy to tell your kids every three or four years that you have to move again yeah yeah i mean i my kids weren't born in this house but they lived in this house their entire lives and now they've got their own mm. houses and they've said to us you're never to sell that house we're gonna yeah you know, you're leaving yeah. that house in the box yeah <laughs> and um 
Yeah. I never had that. This is the longest I've ever lived in a house. And because every, every three mm. years, our parents would say to us, yeah. Um, yeah. right, we've been asked to We're go off. elsewhere. Yeah. And we would say what kids say. We'd say, what about our friends? And they'd say what parents say, which mm. is you'll make new friends. And, and yeah, you know, I guess I sometimes think, well, I like the friends I've got. Why do I have to make new ones? But, um, yeah, yeah. But, yeah, you know, the, I'm the same. I, I, you know, I've, I've set down roots here, mm. you know, since 1989 because of all this, the traveling we did when, when I was a kid, you know. Yeah, I mean, look, and, and I, for, for a moment, I wouldn't, I'm very quick to point out and add that I am glad we did those things. I know that we mm. wouldn't, mm. I wouldn't be a writer if it weren't for those things. I mean, yeah, I, I remember yeah. really clearly the experiences I had in Fiji that made me want to be a writer and, and the books I mm. read and the, and so forth. And um, yeah, so I, I don't know that if we'd been, we had stayed in Australia through those years, I would have had those mm. sort of, I'm hesitant to, use the word, hesitant to use the word trauma, but writers do need some kind of, a bit like a pill, they need some kind of irritant to, <laughs> to give them something to work around. Yeah, and, yeah, yes. Yeah, you know, that's one of the things for me, I think. Yeah. Yeah, I agree with you. And like I, I was born in New Guinea and um, went to Fiji as well. And there was this period where missionaries were revered. Um, but I remember that, that time period right. too. You'd come back and all of a sudden it's like, uh, that life had moved on so much and there was zero respect, uh, not even a knowledge of, and you, of what you were dressed have done, a little bit you know. differently from the others as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. You're yeah. definitely out of the loop. And, you know, um, but I, I think, uh, and, and again, like I agree with you, there's these, these, whatever has happened in your life, I'm not saying it makes you a better person, but it makes you here and now. Whatever, mm. whatever happens, here we are. You got to deal with it. Make the best of it. Um, and 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 if you've had a bit of trauma, like you say, the the pearl uh, analogy there, yeah, you you can kind of produce some interesting creative things from that. Well, I, I can definitely draw a line from the the fact that I mean Clancy, who's watching now, her brother Shannon and I were best friends in Fiji. Right. And um, we remain best friends. And um, yeah. even though he lives in, in London now, but but we had a, we, he was a couple of years younger than me, but we were very close. And we, between us, we had a very extensive library of, of books, of children's books. He, because his parents bought him lots of books and me because my parents bought me some, but also because dad had this, this degree he was doing and all these amazing books arrived. And there, there was a couple in there that really stuck with me. One of them was called The Mouse and His Child by Russell Hoban. And that's a story about belonging. And it's a story about a, a, a young mouse trying to, a, a wind up toy mouse trying to, and his father trying to find their way back to where they're from against adversity. And the duo that I play in, the, the band slash duo I play in is called Last Visible Dog. And that is taken directly from that book, The Last Visible Dog, because as I remember reading it. And it's a book that I read every couple of years again. And every time I read it, I get something more from it. It's a, I don't know if you've read it at all, Peter, but it's a... Um, no, I haven't. It's a work of philosophy written for kids. But every time you read it, and I've read it, I don't know how many times now, um, it gives me something more. And there's this great moment where the mouse and his child, they're standing there in the bottom of this pond, and they've got their arms joined because but when they worked, it would you'd wind them up and they'd go in circles and you'd lift the child mouse up and down like little metal clockwork toys. But they're standing there and the mouse is watching, the, the child is looking at this dog food can, bonzo dog food, that's in the mud behind his father. And on the label is a picture of a dog with a chef's cap on holding a tray. And on the tray is a can of bonzo dog food. And on that bonzo dog food is a picture of a dog with a chef's hat holding a tray. And on that tray is a can of bonzo dog food. And on that bonzo dog food, and, and so on and so on. And so he stands there and he looks at this label for who knows how long. It could be days, it could be months, it could be forever. It's hard to know. And he looks at it. And then he's, tr and he's trying to see the last visible dog. And he's just looking for that last visible dog. And then finally he thinks he's seen it. He goes, there it is. And then there's the 
bit of label drifts off in the water, drifts off in the water, and this big turtle swim past and goes boom and disappears with it. <laughs> and I didn't really understand it. I still don't entirely understand it, but I think mm. he's having a. I think there's a sort of these um, absurd amount of inf ad infinitum thing going on there. Mm. And but there's all these bits in there that are works of philosophy, and it's a. I a love that. Book, uh, my mind is. Book. My mind is already reeling it's with different ideas. You know, book. yeah, check it out. Yeah. It'll you'll write several songs from reading that book. I promise you. <laughs> the other one was um, a book called Josh by Ivan Southall, and this is the first book by an Australian writer to win the Carnegie Medal. I think in '69 or se no, '74. I don't know. Anyway, and it's a book about a boy who is very much like I felt as a young boy living in Fiji. He's a kid called Josh Plowman who lives in the, in Melbourne and then out in Ryan Creek in this little little town out in the bush in Vic, country Victoria, there's a bridge that was built by his grandfather, his great-grandfather. And if you're going to be a real plowman, if you're going to identify as a plowman, you have to go and stay with Aunt Clara and play aeroplanes on her giant organ she got a pipe like a thomas organ or something. and so he goes out and he doesn't want to go because he's comfortable being a bookish kid in the city but he's told you got to go and so he goes and it's just horrifying for him he gets there and there's um you know the kids are horrible to him and he he hates everything he doesn't understand it he's his, his aunt, aunt he takes his book of poems and reads them without his consent so he feels betrayed in that way and then Finally, and I, I was reading this book and it was resonating with me about this kid who just wants to fit in and just feels a bit out of place. And then there's this moment where he falls off, he's running away from a cricket match that he has been forced into playing and he doesn't want to. And he, they, the boys, the other boys are giving him a set of cricket clothes, flannels that are way too big for him. He looks ridiculous. So he's running away from them. They're saying, we're going to drown you, we're going to kill you. And then he falls off this bridge into the river below. And there was, there was a two, there's a two-word sentence in that book, in the end of that chapter, and it just says, Josh, comma, drowning. And I remember reading that two-word sentence and going, okay, so all these rules that, of writing in English and stuff that I was actually pretty interested in, they can be broken. Those rules can be broken. If you, and I, I would argue that that's probably the first the first um, verse novel in Australian literature, even though it wasn't re written as verse novel, it's, it's many ways formatted that way. And I remember reading that and being excited at the idea of being able to create stories in ways that weren't conventional. But the third mm -hmm. book that really spoke to me was The Lion, the Witch and the Wardrobe by oh, C.S. Yeah. Lewis. Now, I was so conflicted by this book that I, when I did my master's, I wrote a major paper on C.S. Lewis, because I think C.S. Lewis has been, but the, the, the angle of my paper was that C.S. Lewis has been misinterpreted by both sides. Interesting. Because for the conservative Christian, C.S. Lewis is held up as being the ultimate apologist. Like he's almost the gold standard apologist. Yeah. And I don't yeah. buy it. I just don't buy it. Mm. You know, when he brings up that, the triumvirate or the, the, um, um, trichotomy of Jesus could have he, he was either mad, bad or God mm. and we know he wasn't mad and we know he wasn't bad so he must be God mm. to me I go well why are we ruling the first out we know mad people exist and we know bad people exist we don't know if gods exist so why are we immediately discounting mm. those first two to go to the least likely that's just yeah. one of my problems I have with his with his apologism. But yeah, uh, do you think he was grappling and aware of that dichotomy as well? I don't know. I don't know. But my point like is, sometimes people know it, but they they're they're writing it in a way to make people think a little bit differently. Yeah, those who grasp it, yeah, perhaps. But the, my point is that people like um, Alistair. I've forgotten his name now. I was going to say Alistair Cook. He's the opening batsman for England. Um, Alistair McGrath and other people hold C.S. Lewis up as being the gold standard apologist, you know, right mm. up there with Mor with um, 
Josh McDowell and all these other guys who I think are also very flawed in their in their approach. Mm, interesting. But the other end of the spectrum are the people like the Philip Pullmans and J.K. Rowlings who read The Lion, the Witch and the Wardrobe and the Narnia books and then absolutely panned them as being some kind of um, propaganda. Mm, then you got mm. people in the middle like Laura Miller who didn't realise that she was reading a, Christ, a Christian allegory until she became an adult and then someone told her and she went, what? When did this happen? When I was deceived. So when I was a kid, I read that and I, I, I saw it immediately. But there was, and, and I knew I wanted to be a writer when I read the bit where the children each hear the name of Aslan for the first time. And he, they haven't, they've never heard of Aslan before, but Mr. Beaver, they're having lunch with Mr. Beaver and Mrs. Beaver and they, and Mr. Beaver says, I, I hear that Aslan is on the move. And of course, Aslan is the Jesus character. He's the, he created created Narnia and all And when the children hear the name of Aslan for the first time, they each felt rather differently, he says. He says that Peter felt brave and adventurous and Edmund felt mysterious horror. But then he said that Susan felt like a lovely strain of music or a lovely smell had drifted by her. So rather than saying she felt excited, he said she felt like this and pointed out something that we've all experienced. But my favourite one was Lucy. And he said that when Lucy heard the name of Aslan for the first time, she felt the way you feel when you wake up in the morning and realise it's the first day of summer or the first day of the school holidays. And everybody who reads that immediately knows that feeling they're talk, she's talk, he's talking about. So rather than give it some kind of limiting description, like she felt optimistic or she felt excited or she felt thrilled or she felt breathless. No, he said, she, you know that feeling that you have when this happens? You remember, remember that feeling? That's what she felt. And you can immediately pin her on that. And that was the moment when I knew that this is what I wanted to do for for a living. I wanted to tell stories. How, how old were you? I was at eleven. That point. Wow! And I wanted wow. to tell stories. Eleven or two. I wanted to tell stories with characters that were as identifiable as that. Mm. But, but then came the moment where C.S. Lewis unravelled it all for me. Right. Where he said, and he was presented with as as the great apologist that he is. He's presented with the opportunity to explain in simple terms to everybody how the blood bargain works, how Jesus dying fixes everything. Mm. Because the, the girls, Lucy and Susan, go to Aslan after he's died and risen from the dead, and they say to him, we don't understand how this works, Aslan. Edmund did the wrong thing. He's okay now. You died. You're back. Everything's done. How does that work? And that's his opportunity as the greatest apologist the world has ever seen, apparently, to explain how that works. But his response is wholly unsatisfactory. He says, oh, children, it is a far greater magic than you can ever understand. Yeah. And I yeah, felt wow. cheated. I felt like he had completely dodged it. He had, he had his chance and he fluffed his lines. And I never really mm. forgave him for that. Yeah. That and the racism mm. in the last battle. But we're going to go to that. <laughs> yeah. I, I have tend to find, so I bring it, instead of Christian apologists, we'll bring it into the category I'm kind of most well-versed with, the Adventist apologist. Morris Vendon? Are you going to say Morris Vendon? Uh, no, 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 but he, he is a popular one. Yeah, but yeah. I, I've not been satisfied with any Adventist apologist, past and present. I, I just find that I, and, and I've interviewed many, I just come to a point where I think, yeah, wow, that's something's not adding up there. Well, I don't know why that is. I'm, maybe I'm biased or I don't know, but... Uh, um, well, I was talking more with sorry. my parents about exactly this a couple of days ago. Mm. But if you... If you have a belief that you have to hold for whatever reason, be it for your position or for just for your comfort or, you know, a bit mm. like the f female ordination, you know, to maintain the status quo, we won't rock that particular boat, you know which hill you die on, you know, ch mm. choose your own platitude. Um, mm. If you have a particular belief that you need to backfill, mm. then... Um, then you'll backfill it in that way. And this is what we see with the, I think, this is one of the reasons we see the American evangelical church, the 
MAGA right wing evangelical church in America who, you know, never have I been more reminded of. I think it was Mahatma Gandhi. Somebody said, What do you think of God? And he said, or Jesus. He said, I, th I think Jesus is great. It's his fans I'm not a fan of. And, <laughs> yeah. you know, and the fact that Americans have to get behind what Israel's doing right now because you've got to support Israel. And the reason you've got to support Israel is because your belief is that Jesus can't return until Jerusalem is under Israeli rule. And so, therefore, despite all the horrible things going on, we have to get wholly in bed with Israel. And it's backfilling a it's backfilling a belief to it's 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 like the guy. And I, I mentioned this from time to time. The guy who's driving past the the barn in the country, and there's a guy there firing arrows at the barn. And every one of those arrows is right in the middle of the bullseye. He goes, "You're incredible." He goes, thank you. And then he gets out, he fires another arrow into a wall and he gets out with his paint and draws a target around the arrow. <laughs> and I think it's a bit I like, like I think it's a bit like that. Yeah. And yeah, yeah. And I, it's it's probably a really clumsy example, but I think that it probably holds for the purposes of this discussion now. Yeah. The idea that you know, I, I believe in evolution. I think evolution is factual. I think there's evidence for evolution. I'm perfectly okay with the Genesis story being poetry or mythology or whatever you want to call it. I don't believe the world was created in several literal working days. But I do believe that if you are going to have a seventh-day Sabbath that you have to hang everything on and... Perhaps that's not, not so much the hanging point it used to be. But certainly when I was growing up, Sabbath was mm. the big one. Oh, it I mean, still it's, is. It's right there in the name, it's, Seventh Day, right? It, yeah, it is the biggest one still. And if you've got, if you are hanging so much on that Seventh Day thing, mm. and there wasn't a seven day week on which to mm. base it, mm. then what are we doing? And so it just that feels to me like, and I know it's more complex than that. There'll be people going nuts, going, you don't understand the basic theology. Yeah, maybe I don't. All I know is that. It feels to me like that is something that you have to hang on to that creation story and mm. find any way to to devalue the science that's evident mm. because if you don't have that seven-day creation story, one of the central pillars of being seventh day, then it starts to crumble. Yeah, yeah. That, that's, that's very true. Yeah, and I agree with you on that too. I've, I've got no problem with... Um, evolution and and allowing science to kind of reveal one of the things I love about science is that um, philosophically speaking not that it's a religion but um, you don't have to have a religion to be philosophical uh, I like that if if something is found to be wrong scientists don't have to do the reverse engineering and make it fit and mm -hmm. uh, though some have but it, you they can go oh the evidence doesn't let's keep moving on we'll we'll look at it a different way or look at something new well, speaking yeah. of Shannon, who we mentioned a minute ago, he, a dear friend of his, Chris Wheeler, who who died, I don't know, 20, 30 years ago, I think. But Chris used to say, he, and I don't know if, he, if it was his idea or if he borrowed it, but he used to say that the evolution of religion was like two baskets where one basket is the God basket and the other one is the science basket. And initially everything was explained pretty much by the god basket you know the sun came up the sun went down that was a god in a fiery chariot and you know you'd have incantations and you'd have a, a year of good but you've said the wrong incantations apparently you'd get a year of bad harvest or whatever and then gradually one by one and all the things that we believe to be explained by the supernatural were moved over into the science basket mm. and we keep moving things into the science basket even in our lifetime, we've seen things move into the science basket that weren't there before. But I challenge anyone to name one thing that has gone the other way. Exactly. Just yeah. one. And to anyone who's listening mm. on in the chat, hit me. Mm. Ricky Gervais got some really funny things to say about that. He's got some really good explanations of that very thing. Um, it's interesting too, 
I, I was chatting to a friend who is very big on, he, he's a very conservative Adventist, but he's very big on the, the date line and how it's been changed over the years and how it's affecting the Sabbath keeping. And, and I said, look, it just, and I have, I've got a globe over there. I just held it up and I turned some lights off and just put one light on it. And I said, look, as we go around, here, here's Samoa now. And look, at this, there's dark on this side and there's light on this side. See that line there? That's the demarcation line. You don't have to be exploring the the changes made in 1839 and the ones done again in 1902 or back whatever. That there, that's the sun. There's the line. And he was like, "Oh wow!" And I said, "But then you got to work out well where did where did that day start and why do we follow it from? Is it Greenwich time? Um, why not Jerusalem?" And um, so if you if you're going to make the Sabbath a key salvational issue on a sphere. It's just impossible to do that. But again, you'll have all sorts of apologists defending, reverse engineering, shooting an arrow and drawing the target around it. I like that one. And Ellen White, when she was confronted with that, and I, I think I'm right in this quote, she said something about, well, everyone should move to closer to the equator then if, they, if they're living in the Nordic realms. And I thought, mm, not a very yeah. satisfactory yeah. answer. Yeah, well, I can't imagine what it... Yeah, because um, I, I remember when I was 21, when I turned 21, I did some maths and worked out that I'd, I'd spent seven days, um, seven years, sorry, three years of my life collectively waiting for the sun to go down. And I remember those, <laughs> I remember those, wow. those long, yeah. long, long, long Saturday afternoons during daylight saving where you just be, yeah. Oh man, it's all going to be the party's going to be over by by the time I even get there. You know. Yeah, um, I used to love um, watching Get Smart, and and it and I remember the there was a time where it. I, I remember the time it used to finish at six thirty, start at six, um, and and I remember that the. the times when the sun was going down at 6 24 right. and i knew that the, get smart the last four or five minutes is where everything wraps up you know and, and i'd hear mum call that tv off son oh, okay so i turned the volume down and just be watching to try and work out how it was happening and and you you, you know we laugh at that uh, but there's it's just well you'd better you know, hope there's if, no investigative if, judgment hadn't you Peter? Yeah, otherwise that's sure. that's in the book for sure <laughs> yeah yeah exactly you know that's a sin i'd have to remember and ask forgiveness for um and so yeah just back to the adventist apologist those watching if you can name me an adventist apologist that supplies satisfactory um explanations of adventism please I'd love them on the show because I've not been satisfied with a single one. Uh, well, there are people, also people, the Christian ones like Lee Strobel, who everyone talks about Lee Strobel being, you know, mm. watertight. But he's not watertight. He starts with so many assumptions that you just Is have that to the Irish guy? Him. No, American guy. But um, And the other thing that's always mm -hmm. kind of given me a little bit of pause for thought is when people will say... Um, what about so and so? He used to be an atheist and then he became a Christian. So, you know, obviously, you know, if somebody who is so diehard atheist can become a Christian, there must be something in it. And I'm going, are we going to ignore yeah. all the people who used to be Christians who became atheists? Does their does yeah, their opinion yeah, mean yeah. nothing? Right? People love the uh, exception to the rule. Is that right? Yeah, um, the, 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 the the anecdotal Anthony evidence. Flew, yeah. Anthony Flew and the C.S. Lewis. And the, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, we as humans, we kind of love, well, that, you know, that's not my experience. Um, too bad that another, I, I, I think I read recently that something like 46 million people have left the Adventist church since the 60s. I think that might be right. Um, and I read, uh, if, if you go and get a chance, I think it's number 139 and 139A, Defeating Adventism. James over there at uh, Academy Apologia. Um, I think uh, he's just done a, two really good videos on um, the stats, the current stats, 2022. And it's gone something like from a, um, a, a lower kind of apostate um, uh, number statistic to it was about 40 something percent. Um, and then before lockdown, it was up to about 60 something, maybe percent and now it's close to 71 percent of adventists who 
um, joined the church or born into the church are, are leaving. Um, so there's some pretty big numbers there. So you might be able to go, well, hey, you know, that's not my experience, but there's millions and millions who do share the experience. Yeah, right. Not that that even actually makes it right or wrong no. just because the majority does anyway. But but to, my point is to discredit someone by saying, well, that's not my experience, you, you're therefore wrong, doesn't let the dialogue kind of continue where I think it's the dialogue that reveals, you know, uh, situations and scenarios you can agree upon. Yeah, I mean, like I want to, I want to also make the point that um, you know, people say, you know, angry, angry atheists. I'm, I'm not angry. I, things that make me angry would make me angry regardless of what the cause is. You know, injustice and and the, I had a there was a particular teacher, a couple of teachers when I was at school who made my life pretty unpleasant. Um, I don't know whether it was because my dad was a deputy head or whether they were just awful people, but. I don't think it was the fact that they're Adventist teachers that made them awful no. people. I think they're just horrible people. Horrible and, people. Yeah. And um, you know, I've met some. Yeah. So I'm, I'm not angry about that. I just, uh, as I, as you say, the the person that you are now is made is the sum of all those things that you experienced, and yeah, none of that is regrettable. Yeah. Let's go to a couple of uh, comments. There have been quite a few there, and if there's any that you want me to draw up, just let me know. Um, I'm not even looking way, at comments right now, so maybe I should. Way be. back, uh, way back, Andy Mack, who I did an interview with a, a couple of weeks ago, fantastic um, conversation we had. Uh, now I'm moving from Adventism. I can see the pathway towards athe atheism, and I'll just take that as a comment. But uh, but I certainly um, found that. Um, Jim Fitzsimmons, and I don't know if Jim's being tongue in cheek here. He. <laughs> He often asks and makes some pretty um, <laughs> provocative comments, but I, he's saying there, James. I would say Satan is a secular humanist. Um, we'll, we'll take them. We'll take him at his word, unless uh, he says otherwise. But <laughs> uh, he also says, James, what is your view of an afterlife? What was my view of an afterlife? Um, as nihilistic as it might sound, I don't think there is one. I think um, we are just a fairly advanced um, primate, and when the electricity in your brain goes out, then that's that's curtains. Which is why it's important to enjoy and do the best in the life that you have. We're not clean. We're not wiping our feet waiting for the big show. Yeah, and I think having a meaningful content filled life of purpose doesn't have to be rocket science it can just be suddenly going you know what love my family love having nice dinner good food looking at a sunset feeling the sun on my back i was singing at, at this um funeral yesterday which was um the the wake was outside and the sun was just full and i i there was no shade <laughs> and i'm just singing there playing my strat and singing into the sun and and um i do not know why but i've got no sunburn i had no sunscreen no hat and um i actually i can see a little line across the top of my head there <laughs> but i just loved life but it was at a funeral and it was just this really interesting kind of um thought process going through my mind where I was enjoying singing, feel the sun on my face, but incredible sad loss. Um, and life is like that, isn't it? It's that balancing of those two kind of realities that um, there's a lot of stuff you just, you know, a lot of the philosophizing in the end cannot really make a difference, you know? So the question is, what what's your view of an afterlife? You know, to 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 even try and explain it and and make a whole religion surrounding it can, mm. can seem, I'm not sure if arbitrary is the right word, but. Um, it was interesting that um, there's a, <laughs> Cindy, Lou, Cindy Lou has got a lot to say, that's okay. Um, but somebody here has said that um, as an ex-SDA and now atheist, I'd not reject offspring if they're still Christian. Well, no, indeed, and my mm. 
my oldest daughter is a Baptist mm. and um, she knows my position and I know hers and that's all cool. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. That, that's a better sign of what a loving father is than someone who says they would disown them like the person you were mentioning. I'm just going to read uh, David Geelan, also been on the show, great uh, human oh, hello. being. Hello, David. had dinner with David not that long ago. Uh, yeah. yeah, great guy. Love having his comments. Um, and he's replying to the previous comment about Satan as a secular humanist, I think. Um, yeah. And he's saying Jim, as in Jim Fitzsimmons, he'd be interested in, to, uh, in how you get to that view. Uh, he's literally a fallen angel, a religious figure, so hard to be secular. And as represented in scripture, he's also anti-humanist. Yeah, so how do you even get to the view that Satan is a secular humanist uh, when uh, the claimed literature literally would say he's not that? Thanks mm. for that, David. Don't know if you wanted to comment on that. Um, no, I haven't got much to add to that, to be honest. And I think David adds Sam Totman of the band Dragon Force was similarly brought up on hymns. This is back when we were talking about that, mm. and you can hear it in that band's song. And I know David is a David is a massive metalhead. Yes, that is very true. Mm. Uh, and and um, Jim Fitzsimmons has just put David just some dark humour. Yeah. So I'm not sure really what. Uh, I'm sort of interested in the one that Rodney's has put there. It takes a lot of faith to be an atheist. Well, I'm really sorry, Rodney. Let's we could talk about what faith actually is, but uh, um, yes. Yeah. And I would say, well, can't faith be used to support any belief? Pretty much. Um, so we're just scrolling through, and then I want to kind of come to a close chatting about your books um, and and. I don't want you to say what your favourite is, but just what kind of books, if, if someone said, hey, look, I want to get to know James Roy's, um, his, his creative output, mm. where would you kind of funnel people? But we'll come to that um, in a minute. Yep, yeah, sure. Um, oh, my dog wants to say hello. Ah, uh, hello. What's the dog's name? This is Humphrey. Hello, Humphrey. Ah. Uh, Beautiful dog. Yeah, he's a good boy. Is that a well, sausage yeah. dog? He is a sausage dog. He's a he's yeah. a veggie link. <laughs> they, I saw the cutest little mini one the other day. Oh, uh, hang on. Uh, Sorry, lost my headphones. That's, that's all right. Uh, I'm free. I'll Get carry on here. I saw some really good uh, comments. Sorry, I missed early. all of that because Humphrey was sitting on my head. Oh, that's all right. I just I, I missed a whole. Um, lot of interesting comments but people can um if you're in our facebook group those watching go and look us up that's where a lot of the um comments continue after an interview yeah. and uh those watching on youtube if there's something you've said you'd really like to remain be still a part of the conversation you just need to add it again for some reason when, when you go live on youtube um and it's left up there all the comments disappear so if there's something you really want to um now, someone just said uh, uh, about a link to Fight Club. I think just look up SDA Fight Club. I mm. don't think in Facebook, I don't think there's anything else there. Motor Sapien, uh, referring to that father that we just referred to where he'd kick out his kids. It's stories like that about the father throwing the kids out that leave the kids to renounce it all. Um, mm. But those parents are acting like the God they believe in. Mm, that's true. Um uh, Nathan, I think he might have already commented on this one. Uh, as an ex SDA now atheist, I'd not reject offspring if, oh, yeah, you did say if they are still Christian. Yeah, that's Nathan. Now we'll just bring up um, Cindy Lou, who actually is a regular um, hmm. watcher or contributor, and love having your honest thoughts, Cindy Lou. Keep them coming. Matter can neither be created nor destroyed. Who, what lit the fire, <coughs> excuse me, under the Big Bang or the Higgs boson particle? God is much too huge to fit in <coughs> and delusion Ellen G. White could dream up. Well, I mean, the, the, the straightforward <coughs> answer to that question is, I'm sorry to sound like a cliche, but who created God? If everything that is, exists had to be created, who created God? That's 
And to and to and it sounds like I'm having a go at Cindy. I'm really not. But when you say Cindy, at the end of being, you're right. I'm wrong. No harm, no foul. We dissolve in nothingness. I'm if I'm right and you're wrong, I go into what comes next, and you are toast. I'd urge you to look up Pascal's wager. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the Pascal wager is a fascinating. And I've heard the Pascal wait. I've heard Pascal's wager. I've heard Pascal's wager literally preached from the pulpit in Adventist church. Interesting. They didn't call it Pascal's wager, but they laid it out in those exact terms. Yeah, let's look at this as being a four, you know, if this is the case, then this and this and this. But if that's the case, however, so if therefore we should, we should choose to believe blah, blah, blah. Mm. But my argument to that would be you can't choose what you believe. You can be convinced or you can't be convinced, but you can't choose to believe something. Mm. That's a very good point. Yeah. And, and uh, to Rodney, and, I'd say when Rodney says both of you gentlemen are seeking answers, God is not beyond showing up and answering all your questions. Mm. Um, I don't want to be, I don't want to be rude, Rodney, but you don't know what questions I've asked. You don't yeah. know yeah. <laughs> of the tearful nights I spent begging God to show Himself to me mm. when I was a lonely kid returning from the mission field. So, mm. due mm. respect, Rodney, you don't know. Yeah. It's just a ad hominem attack. Um, Adventist analyzer, I, I love that name. Uh, Dr. Joel Wallach, dead doctors don't lie, says that gluten is a very deleterious, is that correctly pronounced? Deleterious to your digestive system. That's from what we we're talking uh, about. Next before. thing they'll be telling us tobacco is bad for you. <laughs> Uh, Cindy, uh, just following on from her comment, I do not believe in the God you do not believe in. That that reminds me of a really um, interesting... Uh, Ty Gibson has got a video out there where he talks about, I'm an atheist too, when he's sitting next to a guy on a plane, allegedly, um, and they get into it this guy is an atheist i think he's reading a sam harris book or something i can't remember and they get into a conversation and ty gibson says to this guy oh i'm an atheist too um i don't believe in all the other gods you don't believe in as well i'll just go one further yeah yeah, yeah but but he yeah exactly well, that's what ricky gervais says and it's and he didn't make it up i don't think mm. but what ty then is isn't saying that he, he he's saying i just believe in one and then goes yeah on to say and i'm just thinking that well then you can't say i'm an atheist too it's just so but so many people watch that and i saw the comments and it's like oh wow yeah you nailed it and allegedly the guy gets convinced by the end of the conversation but my first thought if someone if you're if someone's sitting next to you on a plane and says oh i'm an atheist too and eventually says yeah, i just believe in one God, but I, I don't believe in all the ones you don't believe in as well. Yeah, it's just like a one of those Adventist apologist little loops that I go there. Yeah, it just does not make sense. You you aren't an atheist too, even if you believe in half a God. Mm -hmm. Um, Moto Sapien says, Cindy, and good to see you, Moto Sapien. Um, by the way, all my friends watching from the U.S. of A, I know the, the daylight saving has shifted you to, like, for example, in L.A., you're watching at 6.30 when we kick off. Um, and some of you on the other side, it's getting up to 8.30, 9.30. It, it, it just send me a message if you'd like me to, to make the show earlier my end, which means it just brings it back an hour again. Just let me know. Uh, but Motor Sapien says, ha-ha, that's a good way to put it. Um, and I'm just going to go past a few there, unless there's things that you have seen back. I'm just bringing it up to the present time here on comments. Uh, oh, yes, the Peter, Peter Veach has just said, yeah, the, um, the, the Ty Gibson bait and switch. Yeah, yeah. exactly. I, I, I just don't get why people fall for that though. Like it's such a you're not an atheist too and any atheist would pick that up in one second mm, mm. and that, again that it, it, that goes to what you were saying earlier if you're so invested your whole identity has to wrap around this working the reverse engineering of that target where he shoots at the mm. barn wall and then draws the target. you know that adventism is just demonstrably one big 
piece of reverse engineering around nine, nine, uh, sorry, 1844 not happening. You know, that Jesus didn't come back. Uh, what happened? Reverse engineer, cherry pick, cherry pick. It, it, the very existence of Adventism is not a progression from the gospel or a restoration of Protest Protestantism. It's a reverse engineering to fit a crazy, oh, this must have, ha must have happened then. In... Michael C has asked, is this a Christian and atheist show? I don't think it's either, is it? Well, it's your well, show, I, Peter. I, you can answer I, that. I I um it, it's 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 SDA Q and A, a former Adventist looking in from the outside. So I'm I see myself, and I've said this a million times, as a street epistemologist. I'm interested in what people believe, why they believe it, and can they defend it. And that, that part of it really interests me because a lot of my conversations, I'm not making a claim. I'm interested in what you believe and what and, and can you defend it or explain it in a way that shows you've put some thought into it. Mm. So, uh, Michael C., yeah, that's that's the point of this show is not to proselytise people but to interview people. And my specialty, I guess, I was fifth-generation Adventist, marinated in it, didn't leave till I was 54, Um I feel like I've got a pretty good understanding of what it is as a, as a religion. So that's what I focus on, the Adventist part of, um, you know, my my sphere of understanding. So, yeah, it's, it's not a Christian or atheist show. It's a program that explores what people believe and people that are connected to Adventism. Uh, there's a couple of other interesting ones here. Cindy Lou, I'll just bring up again. I do not believe in Ellen. I oh, just, by the way, when when you watch my shows, does that come across? Like, am I coming across as if I'm trying to push a certain um, barrow or or backstory? Um, I certainly have things I'll disagree with people mm. and people I agree with, but I, I I'm trying to be someone that's and I'm, I'm not a great listener to be honest as you can tell i i go in and out of good listening <laughs> uh but it, it's not an interview situation where i'm just listening to the person i'm also having a conversation mm -hmm. um yeah but a lot of people do say what what are you doing so i'm i'm interested just in someone that's watched a few shows um yeah i mean look and that thought crossed your mind too like what on earth is he doing Oh, look, I, I think that you're, yeah, I think that you've got an interest in it from a, in, in, <laughs> oh, sorry, I just saw Rodney Smith's latest comment and I, uh, I ignore, I have, ignore I have to Rodney. laugh, I have to Rodney's, laugh at that. Rodney's job in his life is to derail my conversations, so just ignore. He, uh, apparently I've convinced him that in my heart I'm an SDA. Yeah, uh, he's, he, yeah so, he's just derailing, ignore. You're entitled to your opinion, Rodney. Even Rodney, you're completely stop wrong. trying to de Rodney, <laughs> stop trying to derail my conversation, or, or I'm going to have to give you the twenty day block. <laughs> well, apparently, um, yeah. Anyway, um, look, I don't know. I just, um, I, I've, I didn't realise that you were fifty something when you when you made the jump. I, I thought you were on the journey up much earlier than that. Just my, from, from afar, I, I've done a bit of research into people who have been brainwashed. And it seems like 25 years is the, the number of years that they, gen, the average brainwashed person, the person who's been indoctrinated heavily, takes to get out of their system. Mm. So my thinking of these kind of questions certainly happened well, you know, like age seven to 11, I, I started questioning and asking why and, um, you know, looking at Jimi Hendrix when I was 11, a bit like you're reading that those books. And I was like, I want to do this. I want to. I want to do this. So I, I, in many ways, have been a path back to me. You know, it, it was just. Uh, I feel like my mind left Adventism a long time ago, but I think there was a twenty-five year journey of, of just of, of, what's the word? Debrainwashing is that the <laughs> right mm. word? Um, but yeah, only. I, it'll be eight years ago in a couple of weeks where I officially, you know, this is it for me, wrote a post. This is my last Sabbath as a seven-day Adventist. Mm. Um, 
yeah so anyway and it is interesting and i do understand why people go what on earth are you doing most people go well i've just moved on why keep looking at it there's a number of it's events it's part of your identity and it's like i've always equated it with and i'm not the first person to do this but i've, I've always equated it with being um a bit like being jewish that you know you mm. even if you don't ever attend synagogue or go to temple um yeah. there are still cultural cultural um touchstones that you return yeah. to and um i i i hear what you're saying and i struggle with that a bit in in the, uh, it's there's a whole i wouldn't waste time talking about me right now but i've talked about me enough already but the there's a um, there's a chain of events counting covid that led to stopping doing music a path where I, I I didn't feel Adventist anymore. Mm. Uh, I, I I didn't feel any urge to defend or not defend it. Wasn't angry, bitter, whatever. Um, this is in the last eight years, but due to a certain series of events, I found myself here chatting to Adventists, mm. and and I found it stimulating. It's like it's like um, I, you know I love Star Trek. Um, I'd love to go to a Star Trek convention um i for years i was obsessed with um the golden age of the movies you know up from the silent era till the golden age of the 40s finished another few years and often concurrently going at the same time i was fascinated with the rock and roll era of 57 to 77 and i read every book available another time i started a, a facebook group on jfk and i, I find things fascinating and i and i run the course of kind of exploring them concurrently um out of interesting i checked into the the facebook group that i started on jfk and there's over six thousand members in it now and i i, I left at about 200 members you know <laughs> so my my point is i yeah i a lot of people say oh yeah you want once an adventist all of an adventist or you can take the boy out of adventism but you can't take adventism out of the boy I, I get that, and there's some definite cultural stuff, and and I'm still friends with Adventists, and I love catching up with them. But there's something a bit like what you said before. From a young age, I just, I just didn't feel it, even though when I did leave, I had the identity crisis for a couple of years. I I share all of that not to have to bang on about me, but there's a lot of people. Um, that may be also thinking of leaving and stuff. And this just helps them go, okay, well, here's another perspective. And um, they may or may not resonate with it, but at least it kind of um, humanizes all of our stories. Yeah, indeed. Yeah. Uh, Cindy Lou says, I do not believe in Ellen G. White. Do not conflate her with God or the universal force or whatever. And, and that's interesting, Cindy Lou, because some would say to you, well, you know, maybe we should believe in Ellen G. White and just in case, because if we die and we find out that, oh, hang on, she was right, um, when, when, and we follow the three angels' message, sure, we're safe. We're on with, with, because her, her plan of salvation, as she says, was told to her by God, is a very specific Adventist message. And so maybe some people go, well, I'd better believe it just in case, because I, I'd hate to, you know, at least if I believe it and we get to heaven and we find out. You know, okay, well, I was wrong. Well, at least I had a good life. Or if I was right, hey, I followed Ellen G. White. Yeah, but what's um, the problem with that, Peter? Is that if you, um, what if you get to heaven and Joseph Smith's waiting for you? <laughs> That's what I mean. What do you, who do you, who do you decide that you're going to put your, you know, support behind on the off chance that you're right when you get there? That's right. I mean, look, at people say, uh, I, they're afraid of hell and you go which hell are you afraid of i mean because there's a number yeah. of them whichever one you're you're safe from you're not safe from the others so hell, I, I i have to say that one thing that i was very grateful for growing up was that the yeah. the way of the belief system in which i was raised didn't involve eternal torment it didn't involve a hell that yeah. i yeah. i hear catholics talk about this and even people who haven't been Catholic for most of their lives, still sometimes wake up with nightmares. The idea yeah. that if you don't get it quite right, you, you're going to be tortured for all eternity in the most horrible way possible without any hope of escape. And yeah. that's it. And when you say that to adults, but especially when you say that to children, 
that's yeah. that's abuse. That's a, that's an abusive relationship. And yeah. um, even if I were still a Christian, that's not a God that I would want to worship. Um, so you know, I was always grateful that when I <laughs> when I um, was growing up that there was never that kind of thing hanging over me. Yes, yeah. My my, um, I told you off air. My little daughter Ruby. I was helping her finish a project, and that's why I was a bit late sending you the link. But she was literally here, standing next to me, and she could see me getting this ready. And I had James. She said, "Oh, who are you talking to today? And what will you talk about?" She's only ten, and I said, "Well, we'll probably talk about how we used to think we'd have to go and find caves up in the hills there in the Wadigans and open cans of baked beans." <laughs> And we did talk about it. And she laughed and she said, oh, would, would that have been scary? And I said, yeah, yeah, I was very troubled by that. And I said, but I guess, you know, other people believe in hell and they're going to burn forever. And she said, yeah, yeah, that's way worse than running to the hills. <laughs> yeah, even if it's just not me. Yeah. Uh, just bring on Dale. How are you, Dale? The SDA who believes that he has been deceived may lose all belief in God or an afterlife. Interesting. Um, and David Schramm, good to have you watching, David. David Asherick, I've heard preach Pascal's Wager as well. Stephen Beagles has said, uh, I guess all the prophets of the Bible were delusional. Uh, if you're thinking from a Christian perspective, Stephen, I don't think uh, we would be suggesting that if we are referring to Ellen White, uh, and you might be referring to what um, Cindy Lou just said there, I'm imagining, but um, the the difference between the prophets of the Bible is they had a, a message for the people of their day. Ellen White is painted as someone who's got a, a authority for kind of all time. Uh, Peter Veach has said, Pascal Wager, believe in the sun god Ra or else. <laughs> Um, get you'll give you skin, skin cancer, and uh, just bringing on uh, Dale again. Speaking for myself, I still have a very strong belief in God, but definitely not the SDA God. I believe in the perfect finished work of Jesus Christ. Jesus has brought me through some very difficult times. I'm guessing that would have said, and thank you, Dale, Mark, Anthony. Um, Mark said something really <laughs> interesting earlier. Um, oh, yeah. Do we have the Didn't same? Yeah, yeah. Actually, I wanted to do, I won't do it now, but um, I've got the glasses I'm wearing, these glasses, <laughs> and these glasses, and another pair almost identical. I want to just wear them on the show and just get you guys to vote which one because I'm about to put my distance glasses into one of these frames. So uh, I might, might get some help there later, Mark Anthony. And Mark, Mark said Mark, a really interesting yeah, Mark, Mark said a really interesting thing earlier, but I can't find it. Well, he's just said now ordering life points to God. If life spontaneously came about, the universe should be teeming with it. Well, we haven't explored any of the universe beyond about uh, half a mile from our front door. So I don't know how we can be sure that it isn't. It may be. Mm. Most most um, most physicists are of the view that the chances are there probably is some life elsewhere in the universe. Um, we just haven't met it and we probably never will. Mm. I remember we, we always assume that they want to know about us and they're, they're trying to get here to see us, but I don't know. I don't know why they would. I remember watching a, um, a, a some science show and the guy had one of the uh, – there was two football fields back-to-back -back and he was walking along with one of those measuring metre sticks and he gets right mm. to the end of the two football fields, cuts off a, a nail on his thing, plonks it down, and he says, there's, there's, there's our understanding of uh, – and research done on on the universe the earth and all things uh dale this is a good point peter i don't know if you totally get sd out of your mind completely true uh, and but it's like i don't get out of my mind the golden era of the movies i don't get out of my mind that incredible 
I just was so focused from 1957 to 1977 from from kind of little Richard right up through to the punk era um, I just was obsessed with reading every book available and that doesn't get out of my head even though I've sort of stopped researching it um, Star Wars I haven't I haven't watched Voyager was my favorite I haven't watched that for maybe eight 10 years but I still think about it some of the concepts it doesn't get out of my head and currently I'm just uh, absolutely absorbed and mesmerized by Adventism so it's kind of on my table at the moment cool. um I just bring up I saw something that David Schramm said yeah you guys would get on actually David Schramm makes guitar I, I remember too. David Schramm he yeah. was uh, I think he did if it's the same David Schramm I'm thinking of he um he did nursing at, at the same time as I did. Went and this went guy's and lived USA. In Solomon Islands. Oh, okay, different. Yeah, different. yeah, it might be different. I'm thinking um, David Cram. Ah, oh, right. Yeah, okay. uh, I've been listening to more and more Des Ford videos lately. I agree with him so much. I'm so sad how the estate church treated him. That is so true. Did you just out of interest, and, and it wasn't going to be a big thing on my radar today. But um, how, how old were you? like early 80s when the whole Glacier View thing hit and the church was essentially split in two. Um, when was that? 19, August 1980 was the Glacier yeah. View. I, I literally had to ask my father two days ago to explain Glacier View to me. I, mm. I'm not a little, um, you know, I, I was thinking about this when we were, I was prepared, when I was preparing for this and I just thought, you know, why do I not understand the history of the Adventist Church a bit better? Well, I just don't. I just don't particularly care, to be honest. But, yeah. um, you know, because people have said to me over the years, you know, well, come back and try, try it. Things have changed. And I go, yeah, but the, the very things that make the Adventist Church unique from other faiths yeah. are the things that I don't believe. Yeah. And the history behind it and the way people behaved and all the rest, it's its immaterial to me. And and I would respond to, to Rodney, who I know we're not talking to right now, but I would respond to Rodney when he said, um, you know. You can allegorically. No. Well, yeah, he was saying something about, um, you know, you're searching. I'm actually not anymore, to be honest with you, mm. because mm. – the idea that somebody would say you're searching for God, come back, would suggest that you're you're going to be searching until you reach the conclusion I need you to reach. Yeah, that's what someone yeah. that's what like someone like Rodney is saying. I think he's saying mm. keep searching for as long as you need to search, but don't stop searching until you end up right yeah. back here where I need you. That's a and really with all the res with all point. the respect yeah. on the world to you, Rodney. I don't need your advice on. The questions I should ask. Yeah, I know you. I know yeah. you think you know better than me, because you have this conf this inflated idea of your of of what you know about the supernatural and the spiritual and your place in the world and God's place in the world. But please don't patronise Christian non Christians yeah. and tell them that until they come back to Christianity, they are lost. It's insulting and it's unacceptable. This is why saying to somebody who isn't a Christian. God bless you as you walk away is an insult. It's not you being kind. It is you saying, it is you patronising them and saying, until mm. you think like me, you're wrong and you're lesser than. And mm. it's not mm. acceptable. And people need no. to call this shit out. And, and then they'll call often... it out. And sorry, Rodney, you're the guy who's called it out today on me. And I'm going to have to say it. Rodney, you don't know my experience. You have never met me. And you don't need to make me come back to your way of thinking to make you feel better. Um, yeah. Thank you for coming to my TED Talk. <laughs> and and they'll often follow that up with, if you say, well, I don't believe, so don't bless me um, with a hand on shoulder. Hey, it's okay. God still loves you anyway, even if you don't love him. And then you go, no, no, but I'm, I'm trying to say, I'm, this is a video clip I saw recently. Mm. The guy says, no, 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 I'm trying to say I don't believe in that. And the guy literally puts his hand on the guy's shoulder and says, hey, I'll pray for you. And I and I just could feel the guy just feeling outrage. And and while I know Rodney's goal is to derail my conversations, I, I don't boot him out because every now and again he will say something that allows my guests to respond with some really great thoughts there. 
and 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 I'm not trying to um, explore Adventism to learn anything or to change anyone's mind or to have my mind changed, even though I'm changing my mind about all sorts of things. Uh, I'm absorbed with it in the sense, and I'm not even justifying it. I, I just, people have since day one said, what are you doing? You shouldn't be doing that. And what I, I just don't get when people tell me to do something that I'm just enjoying doing. As I said, with, you know, going to a Star Trek convention, I'm not trying to learn about Star Trekism to become a Star Trek um, mm -hmm. believer, you know, I, it's just a fascinating world. Mm -hmm. uh, but you learn things along the way, like with my JFK stuff. I, I think I know what this, what actually did happen now after like four years of going deep into it. I think he just he was the shooter. That's it. <laughs> I don't <laughs> think there was any conspiracy. <laughs> well, um, yeah, no. <laughs> but um, Michael's razor would suggest that that's the case, right? Yeah. <laughs> Uh, Motor Sapiens says, ha, ha Peter, I've nearly gone to a Trekkie convention before. I binged TNG and Voyage back in 2019. Yeah, yeah. Um, Stephen Beagles, I just want to highlight, Stephen, um, I agree with you on this. People make up their own mind about their beliefs. Everyone will have to live and die with their worldview. And one thing I like about you, Stephen, is that you're not just wildly following your beliefs. You're... Um, you're you're using your mind to draw your conclusions and i guess a lot of what i'm speaking to is people that just follow along and make claims without really thinking about them i'm interested in sometimes i'll challenge someone and i'm interested in their being angry at me for challenging them but i've at least given them an opportunity to define what they believe a bit more clearly and i think that's a that's um you know something that's good to come away with going hey you know i've thought about this a bit more so I'm not saying change your belief, but I'm saying maybe get a little bit better at being able to define it. And so, I, would, I would just reply very quickly to Rodney Smith: Don't assume, don't, don't, don't presume that the fact they reacted to you thinks that you have a good point. Oh, <laughs> God has spoken to me tonight. Oh, thanks, Rodney. Yeah, and I, and again with Rodney trolling, um, uh, he, he he kind of to me represents a certain kind of Adventist and is speaking on behalf of all these kinds of Adventists. And therefore, every now and again, there's a really interesting thought that the person I'm interviewing comes up with because of that. Uh, yeah. Cindy Lou has said, but but having said that, Rodney, careful. I'm, I'm on to you. Stop trying to derail my conversations. Um, and I would say to Cindy Lou, look, I'm sorry if you found me obnoxious and rude. It's not... Um... It's not who I am, but I'm sorry you found me that one. Um, Cindy says, if eternity is full of SDAs, no, thank you. <laughs> Cindy Lou, have you heard that funny story about the, someone getting to heaven and they go through the pearly gates and she says to Peter at the gates, what's that big wall over there built mm. for? And, she, and he goes, oh, shush, that's, that's for the Adventists. They think they're the only ones here. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> um, coming down... Yeah, this is true. Like the more I've looked into this, just out of interest lately, James, I've I've had some. I thought, what what do they mean by the stand without an intercessor? I just wanted to look at that for a little while. So I've gone deep into that. Also, if you want to understand a very brief understanding of Glacier View, just mm. watch the recent one I did. My um, uh, um, it's called setting the record straight. Now there's a series of those, but the most recent one. Um, I think it's a pretty short video and you'll get a sense of, of the importance of um, sociologically speaking, how that um, was a major um, turning point for Adventism. And um, yeah, you might want to just watch that one. Um, and the great controversy has no basis in the Bible at all, a total EG white dream. And, and you can clearly see if you read, um, chapter 28, 29, chapter 39 and 40 of the Great Controversy, which I've read over and over recently for fun, uh, you can clearly see it's 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 not biblical. And Ellen White creates an add-on to the Bible beforehand, uh, setting the scene, and then an add-on of what she says happens after, 
and then embellishes it with all sorts of, you know, uh, interesting literary components all the way through her artistic license. Did you ever study much about Ellen's um, secretaries and how uh, Marion Davis and Fanny Bolton no. um, would take her work and you'd read her original draft kind of copies and she pretty much just wrote in a journal every day all these ideas and cut and copied, pasted people's other books and whatnot and she'd hand it to them and then they'd go and work on it and then give her back and you can you can read the original kind of journaled stuff some more kind of put together things she did and and then the the marion davis and fanny bolton editorial editions mm -hmm. and they were beautiful writers like they were just gifted and um sadly you know they they um were bought into that whole kind of factory production line Cindy's just made an interesting point, actually, Peter. And um, is that the she, humanoids one? No, she just said I've read scientific articles that state that if the frontal lobe of the brain is injured, one can be prone to seizures, delusions, hallucinations, frequently of a religious nature. That's absolutely true. And and I remember the a neurologist from Loma Linda was asked about this in the context of Ellen White because she was hit with a rock and went into the kind of that sort of state of coma or whatever it was for, for some time. And when she came out, she was having um, having visions and dreams of a spiritual nature. And um, they asked him, so if it's completely consistent with subarachnoid hematoma or whichever one it was, do you think that might be what caused Ellen White to be having her particular ideas? And he said, oh, no. This would be the case in most exceptions, but not in her. In most cases, but not in hers. So he was prepared to kind of go mm. that far, but not, not sort of. So he was. Yeah. This is what I'm talking about with the backfilling of your belief. Is is he couldn't take that last step and go? Maybe Ellen White was victim of this as well. He went no. In her case, that's the exception. Mm. 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 That's interesting. And. Um, I don't usually bring Rodney on because, but he's become a bit of the conversation. Peter, you must allow people to rebut you. Um, where did they go? The SDA Church is God's remnant church. And what I was just saying, Rodney, is that's the reason I let you stay in the group because um, you're like a hundred Adventists in one person, and you, you, <laughs> you, you know, you give me the opportunity to rebut all the things. I don't have to have a guest on. <laughs> but, uh, I, I, have you I ever thought about interviewing Rodney? I have. I've done. Yeah. Uh, yeah, okay. yeah, go and check it out. <laughs> it's there. Okay. It's, I think it's called Peter Has a Bible Study or something like that. Uh, only in the last few months too. Um, okay. But I, I just kind of, I'm not meaning to be rude, Rodney, but I just ignore a lot of the comments unless the guest picks up on it. Um, Glacier View was both political and theological. Des and his Daniel class at PUC were very popular. That had to be stopped along with anything else in line with QOD questions and doctrine. That's true. Well, I want to um, kind of bring things to a close talking about your creative output. Um, <laughs> sorry, Rodney just said it's the only interview where Peter sweated. <laughs> oh, I love you, Rodney. Um, so I now I, I think you were saying your website might be down at it the is moment. It is at the moment, yes. Yeah, so I'm having um, issues. So those watching, I'm chatting with James Roy, Arthur, musician, former SDA. Uh, down the track, you'll be able to find his work on jamesroy.com.au. If and by the way, those watching, if you're um, enjoying the content, please click subscribe and thumbs up button there, whether you're on YouTube or Facebook, even with inside Facebook, the private group. If you click the like button or add a comment, it just helps lift the algorithms and means that people within the group, uh, it, it, they send the, the notification to, to more people in the group if you're engaging with it. So that'd be great. And if anyone has a, you know, uh, wants to shout me a coffee, uh, just paypal.me forward slash Peter Dixon music. That'd be much appreciated. And um, that's, you know, pretty much I feel like I'm a, a guitarist busking on the street there, James. And I'm just saying, hey, if you're enjoying the content, throw in a few coins. 
and uh, that's appreciated. So if if um, if I typed in James Roy there on um, Amazon or something like that, oh, um, might find most of my books are the, published in the conventional way. But um, yeah, yeah. Um, tell us if if people wanted to kind of just uh, get into your um, his his penguin books. Just to see if I can bring up a picture to, to show. Uh, the best one to one of the best ones to look at would be um, there's one actually that's probably very relevant to um, people from Avondale around that period that I was there. Is a book called Town, and it's a collection of thirteen short stories that interconnect in, in as much as all the create all the characters are are. Um, all, all the characters are unreliable narrators. And, oh, right. Um, and it, it, it's, it's basically set at a school very much like Avondale High around that time. There's, right. You'll, you'll find a few places in there that, you know, the, the mountains are mentioned and the lake and, and a few other in the the big oh. the big railway tower, or the uh, radio tower out near Shingle Splitters Point and all those things. They're all there. So what's that one called? It's called Town. It's a young yeah. adult book. Okay. It, won, it won a couple of prizes. And and um, and they, these are yours? They are mine. Yes, they are mine. Stuff um, happened, misunderstood. Oh, there, you've gone to the Random House site, Penguin Random House. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah, there's a book called Town. Uh, and there's a book called City that follows on from it. Um, I'm just going to try and, and bring and, up Town. And the if you go to UQP and Town, you'll find it. Um, it's a it's a brown cover, but the idea behind that book was that when you live in a country town, um, you you think you know everyone around you, but right, but you actually don't quite, and it's a tapestry right. of mis misinformation and yeah and whatnot. There's some characters in there that are fairly. A lot of my friends from school had a great time trying to identify different people, um, right. <laughs> And some of them are real, some of them are not. But yeah, and then the next, the one that followed on from that was called City, which was basically exploring the idea that um, we have anonymous connections with the people in the city that we we may not actually, we may not actually know them. So in the in the country, you'll know everything about everyone, but in the um, city, you'll drive across town for half an hour to have coffee with a friend, but you don't know the name of the lady that lives upstairs. Yeah, that's um, interesting. It's a very different way, but the, probably the, the is most. That's their town. The that's the one. Yeah, yeah. yeah, and the other one is just city. Just city. Yeah. Um, interesting. Yeah. Well, I, I, maybe that's a good starting point. Is, is get people to um go and buy um town. Well, I think the the um, better one is probably it was called One Thousand Hills. Right. And that was a um published by Scholastic, and that and that was a book that was co-written with a friend who was a survivor of the Rwandan genocide. Interesting. And I literally, uh, literally was, someone was talking to me the other day, um, wanting me to do a show on that very topic because mm. they, they'd, they'd had some, so you might be the guy. Sure. <laughs> Is this the one? Um, That's the one. That's the one there. Yeah. So, so maybe, um, maybe if we're recommending two books, go and, or three, go and buy Town, mm. City, and uh, 1000 Hills. Yeah. And it was co written with somebody who was a survivor of the Rowan and Genocide. And um, you, that won a couple oh, of big prizes and was uh, went quite well. So I wonder if you'd be able to contact him and we have both of you on the show next month. And, I'm sure and, Noel would love to be on the, with you. Yeah. Let's, let's do that because that's on, a fascinating. Recently on um, Four Corners, I think, because. He's part of that kind of. He's one of the people who has been agitating about um, a lot of about the Rwandan situation in Australia and being targeted by by a number of people who are still kind of like Holocaust deniers of the Rwandan genocide. There was um, the person that said to me, "Hey, you got to get onto this." Um, he he said that the what were what were the two opposing Hutu and Tutsi and, and the Adventists. Uh, that were both fighting each other. Um, mm. One of them wouldn't fight on Sabbath, <laughs> something like that. I don't know if you've heard that story. Um, no, but, but what then, I do, then, what I do know, Peter, is that um, the Catholic priests and nuns who were actively involved in 
the killings and and directing the killers to the victims um when they were asked later how could they as some as um you know priests and nuns do such a thing they said you have to remember we are we are tutsi uh, we are hutu first we are catholic second yeah okay yeah well so, look yeah, there's a lot to unpack uh, yeah, see if you can contact your, your co-author there and um, get back to me on and he's, that. He's, he's still Catholic, despite all of that. Yeah, wow, mm. interesting. Well, my very special guest today has been James Roy, and I've absolutely enjoyed our conversation. I encourage everyone to go and look up his work online, easy to find. Um. I know uh, my sister-in-law is a professional author also. She's written 30-plus books. And my wife... Who's uh, that? Is, her name is Jean Granger. Okay. Yeah. And uh, she's uh, written a bunch of books, Irish books, um, kind of historical, a little bit of romance, a little bit of drama, a uh, little bit of politics. Um, but, yeah, she's she's sold over three and a half million books in the last 10 years wow. and um my wife looks after all the amazon and facebook ads mm. um so when i said i was interviewing you today she was very interested she might even be watching now well i haven't sold as many as your sister and all that's for sure <laughs> so, uh, just hire her she can look after all your facebook and amazon maybe i ads will and... <laughs> maybe i will She's very gifted and she's often said to me, I'm happy to help you with, you know, some of your music and I can help you with the advertising. And I think, yeah, why, why am I not um, accepting well, yes, that incredible question, offer? So. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so uh, I think I will. I think I will. So, yeah, thank you so much for being on the program. We're going to have you. you back in a month. I'm going to hold you to that and contact mm -hmm. your mate. And right. uh, very much look forward to it. Thanks for the big, vigorous and robust conversation as always, everybody. And uh, I've got a couple of very interesting conversations next week. Uh, I'll let everyone know about that in our um, Facebook group. So until next time, James, have a good day and uh, keep, keep rocking in the free world. Nice to chat. Thank you. It's been great. See you later. Bye.